Now would be an excellent time to hit that share button, folks. Do you believe in sharing videos? Welcome to the program. We have a very special guest today. Mr. James Etock is joining us. How are you doing? Oh, I'm not too bad, thank you. We're glad to have you, even though it's a little late where you're at. But uh, as you can tell from the uh, thumbnail kids, he's worked on some pretty cool stuff. So we're going to talk about that (laughs) in just a few minutes here. We also have with us, of course, Valiant Renegade. How are you doing? Doing good. Good to be back here on a Wednesday, and uh, good to see everybody again. I think we're going to have a good show, and there goes my phone. There goes I'm your stupid. phone. Yeah. <laughs> Jonas, that was you calling me just Jonas. now. You're fired, Jonas, even though you're not, not even here. Jonas uh, is fired. Now he's got to call us in as Morgan Freeman and apologize and say, I'm very sorry for interrupting I am going to tell him he's going to have to do that now. Uh, Greg is also here from Fanzine. How are you doing? Doing good. Glad to be here and talking to James and Valiant and you, Tom, as always on 4K4U. Yeah. And we are expecting uh, uh, another guest or two on the way, but we never know who's going to show up when and where on the show. But uh, we're going to talk about all things 4K, or well, actually, more or less DVD. We're going to go back because yeah, <laughs> uh, if you if you haven't noticed, we're doing a, a little differently than we used to do. I've now started to do the uh, rumors and uh, um, rumors and upcoming releases as a separate video as well. And when we have a guest like James here, we're going to bypass all that. So you guys check out that uh, that'll be dropping. Besides being a trailer before the show, uh, it was already. Uh, so you can keep up to speed on the news and stuff like that. And we'll probably come back around and talk about uh, what we've watched this week here uh, a little bit. But uh, for now, we've got a guest here. So we're going to talk to him. And he's got a lot to talk about. Um, he actually brought us some visual aids as well. So that's cool. We got some co- cool pictures uh, of his experience working on the real Ghostbusters DVD set for Time Life, if I'm correct, right? Yeah, back in... Uh... 2008 seems like a lifetime ago yeah yeah it was a long time ago that's why <laughs> so we'll dive deep into that but besides that what just real quick tell the rest of the the audience what other projects have you worked on besides that uh, obviously masters of the universe if you saw the film yeah he managed share has like been my uh my bread and butter as it were for goodness no i'm 20 something years now officially well mainly officially a couple of unofficial things but mainly officially by DVD wise, like I worked on, I've worked on I think every He Man and She release, um, every BCI release during that period where it was like Dungeons and Dragons, Flash Gordon, Defenders of the Earth. Um, it was there was a lot. I had to watch them all as well. I mean, it was it was. I mean, Defenders of the Earth. I had to watch every episode of Defenders of the Earth. And while it's a great premise, it was uh, that was a tough sit because uh, I wouldn't say it's not aged well. It's just visually a very hard show to watch, as in not very good at all. So yeah, I, I you know I did a lot of a lot of DVD work. I was I was researcher. I was responsible for you know recommending artwork to use on the box set and screen captures. And I had to do trivia. And again, Defenders of the Earth. Try and find trivia about Defenders of the Earth. <laughs> well, speaking it of was, great artwork, you got some nice looking shit behind you there, man. Look at that. Yeah, I think I think that I got when we were working on the um, Don't yeah, speaking of Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons, Dragons yeah. Box set. The, uh, yeah, it was a really really lovely page. So I was just like, ooh. I'll, uh, I'll be scanning that, I believe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's been a, a bizarre career of, you know, DVDs, YouTube channels, books, comics, DVDs, YouTube channels, books. Yeah. It, it seems to be a very cyclical thing. And, uh, yeah, currently I'm um, – what am I doing at the moment? Oh, my most recent thing, as we've talked about before, was the uh, He-Man and She-Ra on Blu-ray yeah, for, yeah. for Germany. Uh, with English tracks, let's just always stress that. 
and it looks very nice. Like I know, I can't believe it's an up up convert, but it looks it's, amazing. It's one of those things. Like, yeah. you know, it's it's. There are times where I can see it's an upscale. There are other times where I'm like, it, it's too. You know, it's too good to pick up that much dust mm -hmm. and specs and stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's too good. But, but regardless, it's um, that, that came out very nice. So yeah, we may get on that today, but like I said, we're going to deep dive more so into the real Ghostbusters because that's what you've uh, furnished us with some uh, uh, images from, and I think that's a good way to kind of take us through uh, how these are kind of put together because that's that's the thing here. I warned you, we are the nerdiest of the nerds here. <laughs> so like, we want to know the details. We were just talking about it before the show, in fact. So you already have a good idea of the type of stuff we're going to ask you about or that you would that we'd like to know already. Um, but besides that. Uh, FKHC2005 wants to know where you are from. I think that's a very simple question to answer. Uh, considering question. you got a weird accent there, doesn't sound well, like you're long... from the Americas. No, definitely, I... most definitely not. Although I, I could, I could try and do an American accent. That's almost. I was going like to say, from... is it? I'm going to go out on a limb and say Japan. Oh, you've, how did you know? That's, I mean. <laughs> I was thinking New Jersey. That's Jersey. what I was thinking. It sounded Jersey to me. <laughs> I knew I'd seen you on a reality show before. <laughs> so, yeah, James, where did you grow up? Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was, um, I, I was born and bred in uh, merry old London in the UK. Just double checking that. Um, yeah, but although when I was born, the, the doctor turned to my mother and said, is the father Vietnamese? Because apparently I was a very... Asian looking baby. And if you look at child photos of me, it's like, I, I, where was I from? But apparently I was born and bred in uh, London, although I think I may have been found somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm from London, although when I speak to sometimes I speak to fellow Londoners, um, if I meet them at a party or something like, hey, where are you? Are you from New Zealand? I'm like, no, I'm not from New Zealand. I'm from, I'm from London. <laughs> I'm from the last London person in London. Yeah, so, yeah it's, uh, it's an odd one. No, and uh, well, so that means you grew up with the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Why'd you remind me of that? I don't need yeah. to be reminded of that. <laughs> so, but have you ever worked on anything? I know you've posted some things, but have you ever worked on anything Ninja Turtle related? I have, I must have. I know I was, I was asked to be a part of a couple of documentaries. Oh, I was, I was on the Toys That Made Us Ninja Turtles. I mean, that doesn't really there count. There you go. That's just, that's oh, yeah, being interviewed and talking about Ninja Turtles. That was. So the first one, the toys that made us season one was I came on and talked about He-Man. I'm like, hello, He-Man's really good. And then I popped up. And then when they did season two, I remember walking into the studio where they were filming. And I was like, oh, someone's now got a budget because season one was just you're in front of a green curtain. It's like, we're going to project mm -hmm. Castle Grayskull behind you. I'm like, oh, it's probably my worst nightmare. But they did, did a good job. But season two, they had this whole set for the toys that made nice. us, like purple shells. It was a really beautiful set. I remember cool. going in and talking about Ninja Turtles and I talked and talked and I'm pretty good at waffling. And they were like, oh, <laughs> such great material. I talked about Hero Turtles. I talked about, you know, James Avery. I was like, I can't believe, you know, Uncle Phil was the shredder. It was amazing right? back in the day. <laughs> talking about all that stuff. And then and then when the program, I think when season two started to air, I was like, oh, they've got some, they've gone from just having like fanboys and, you know, historians and experts to now they've got like, Kevin Smith on board and this person and that person. And sure enough, like I think the Ninja Turtles had, you know, I understand it's like, I, I think I was all, all on the Ninja Turtles episode for all of 10 seconds. I was just like, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> you've interviewed me for an hour and a half. <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was fun to see that, that change in budget. Like the well, first season of toys that made us, there was, like I say, there was right. me and a guy, a camera guy asking me questions, just two people in a room season two, like, camera guy question person this the, the, and some just random dude behind a curtain i was like what's he even doing over there I just i had some shuffling <laughs> i was like I, I leave that over there that might be some extra service but yeah it was um that was so that, i guess that's the closest i came up um, i've done some ninja turtles work it, it's crazy i've worked on so many things over this i've I've forgotten a lot of it now. That's old age. I don't well, that's know. That's kind of the way just... it was with Robert, too. Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. I did do that. Uh, but, yeah, because there is a connection between He-Man and Ninja Turtles, which is funny because it actually brings us around to the Ghostbusters because my childhood consisted of, like, you know, like Superman and Star Wars were there when I, from my memory from always. But then He-Man was something that I was introduced to, and it just changed my world. 
And then after He-Man, of course, there was Ghostbusters. But just after Ghostbusters, it was all green. It was Ninja Turtles all the oh. way after that until the end of my childhood. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and of course, like I said, there is a connection between He-Man and, and Ninja Turtles, of course, because one of the main designers for He-Man left and went over to <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Not and I think... That. Yeah, yeah, so like, yeah, and uh, so we'll get into like the ins and outs of that some other day. But what we're going to hear talk about today is the production of the DVDs for Time Life of Ghostbusters and maybe some He Man and other stuff when we get to it. Uh, and yes, Karam, that is a D&D poster in the background. I don't know if you're on delay, maybe we haven't, he hasn't got to that part yet, but uh, or he's coming in late, that could be as well. But yes, uh, so tell us what we got here. We've got some pictures. You said yeah, I, I just want to tell so the watchers the that I, I spared you because I, I have like about a hundred photos from this, and I thought I'll just. He it thinks down he to... spared us, and we're just like, well, what yeah. are the other fifty now? <laughs> yeah, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see them. <laughs> I just realized when when my camera when the camera goes this, you see the uh, the true set. It's like there's all space up here. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So yeah, this was this was me on the plane over because like th this all goes back to. Um, working for, on the He-Man and She-Ra and all those filmation and random sets for BCI was Andy Mangles was the producer on most of those. And if you know the name Andy Mangles, he's been, he wrote for Marvel, Marvel Age magazine back in the day. Um, he's wrote for Tomorrow's Publishing numerous times, like a massive historian about animation, but also he covers other things. Like one of the like foremost Wonder Woman uh, experts and did and wrote a beautiful uh Autobiography of Lou Scheimer, which I'll kind of get into in a I little bit. I think you bit. got some images here about the Lou Scheimer too, don't you? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that when we get. We'll to get it. to but, those. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll get to those because that's that's a special. And we have another but, guest uh, joining us before you get started here. Oh, yeah, sure. And this is somebody who's also worked in the industry, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. How are you doing, good sir? Oh, uh, hello. Sorry, I'm a little That's late. That's all right. That's <laughs> no problem. We we're just getting started with James and his journey of making the. Uh, Ghostbusters, the real Ghostbusters Time Life box set, and he actually got us some visual images to go with it. Uh, so we're just getting I was just started. Thinking, actually, I just heard him say Lou Scheimer, and I worked on a documentary about ten years ago that I don't think anyone's seen the light. That's seen the light of day. Called um, oh, that's too bad. It was a He Man documentary about who created He Man and Lou Scheimer's in it. Oh, it was the. It's was called it? to Toy Master. Toy Ma yeah, that's the one that ran into some trouble because yeah, yeah, like. After that, like they did a documentary called The Power of Grayskull, but the Toy Masters one is it's really frustrating because I believe that's the last ever interview with Lou Scheimer, and I always yeah. wanted to see it. I was so desperate to see like just the raw footage. I was like, I would love oh, to I see Oh, I could it. hook you up. I was gonna say if anybody oh, knows where it's at, it's yeah. the fan radio. Want, I, I was an editor on it. Oh wow. So, and it actually uh, it played at a film festival. I was working on it. The guy that I was um uh I was doing all the special features for the Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Enterprise Blu-rays. Right. And Roger Lay, my fellow producer. Roger Lay, that's it, yeah. Yeah, he, 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 so we, he and I worked together for three years, but he made that documentary with his partner, Corey Landis. And um, we showed it. It had its world premiere, uh, a work in progress version at Fantasia up right. in um, Mont Montreal. So we did go up there and show it theatrically and it went over pretty well yeah i so love they, to see it yeah yeah they i don't know you know it ran into problems then roger and Corey couldn't i don't know they couldn't figure That's out too bad. what it was going to do or license certain things in it but i think i could probably get you to be able to see it that'd be awesome no i kind of vaguely remember hearing about it i think there was was there a trailer james yeah there's a trailer yeah. but i, think but so. I mean yeah, it, i was gonna say it did screen it did screen it at fantasia to a full you know packed I, I thought house. i saw a trailer because i remember that was and then i remember the masters of the universe documentary they also did as well the uh and and around the same time and it was like that one came out but the other one didn't the toy master one yeah that, yeah so anyway you got your uh work uh book here it looks like for yes yeah, so uh, the reason i was on a plane writing notes i think these are commentary notes or yeah or, or something i was so I was on the flight over. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, literally about two weeks prior, Andy Mangles, who I mentioned, had produced all these DVDs. Mm -hmm. Said, "How much do you know about real Ghostbusters?" And I was like, "Oh, so that might like be somebody my... that Robert knows, actually." Yeah, Andy <laughs> Mangles. <laughs> he's he's written Star Trek novels. That's right. Yeah, he's he's like I was I was saying earlier. He was like the he's like the Wonder Woman guy as well. He, yeah, he knows all these Wonder Woman stuff. He's been like an animation historian. I remember buying Marvel Age. Um, comic like magazine back in the yeah. day and yeah. he had like this section called real marvel and it was like yeah. i grew up with the um 
Well, my favorite cartoons in the 80s were the Marvel superheroes ones from the 60s. You know, the Kirby, Don Heck ones where they would move comic panels and make it look like animation. And he had done this kind of episode guide. And I was like, oh, my God, I can. And so eventually I met Andy through DVD work. But um, so Andy and I had formed this kind of friendship. And he said, doing real Ghostbusters, how much do you know about it? And I was always one of my favorite cartoons of the 80s. He said, "Um, do you want to fly out to Los Angeles for a week and work on, you know, interviews and dvd commentaries and help with the whole and i was like okay yeah sure so i think prior to that i had to i've still got the funniest thing is i've still got my documentation going back i've got like a zip file and it's just time life and it's just all the files when i was working on not not like video files or anything like that but just all the documentation the schedule for the filming schedule we did for like who we were interviewing on what day who was coming in that's mark scott zickry the twilight zone guy um there's andy mangles on the left i believe uh, interviewing him so yeah the first day we interviewed my goodness i'm trying to remember mark scott zickry um uh, maurice lamarche uh laura summer voice of egon voice of janine respectively and michael swanigan and there's maurice lamarche um, on the left i was just gonna say uh, here you go yeah, he's, he was such a lovely guy. I was like, I'm, I'm meeting Egon. And everybody else is like, you're meeting the voice of the brain from Pinky and the Brain. I'm like, but it's Egon. He'll always be Egon's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Randomly, the voice of Popeye from Popeye and Son, because by that point, um, oh, who's the voice of Popeye for the longest? Jack Lerner, I think he passed away. So Maurice LaMarche took over the role of Popeye for a few years. Yeah, but um, Any time you pretty much heard somebody doing uh, Orson Welles' it, voice. Orson Welles. Too. <laughs> Yeah, every time I watch Ed Wood, I always get taken out of that scene because I'm like, I know, I know the guy doing the voice. Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's really silly, but um, yeah. So we were filming. We filmed all the interviews at Gang of Seven, who were this animation um, outfit for a while. There's yeah, Laura Summer, voice of Janine. Um, yeah, we were filming at um, Gang of Seven Animation, which was in Van Nuys. So I, I know Los Angeles like really well. I've travelled over there countless times, and. Um, yeah, we uh, we filmed at Gang of Seven because that was run by Tom Teller and Alwitz, who worked at Filmation, was interviewed for the BCI DVD box sets. And so he said, yeah, you can film at my studio. I, I'm presumably charged or something. But it was really nice to be in this animation studio whilst doing interviews. We always did the inter- interviews after hours. But when you would go in about four or five o'clock, you could chat to artists and animators. And there were people like, you know, Bob Klein, who's like a, one of my favorite artists from the 1980s, 1990s bunch of you know disney animators warners filmation and Barbera animators is all there it was just really nice to be in that environment then go and do these interviews after hours so it was um yeah it was quite the experience like it was literally dropped in at the deep end it's like right we're gonna be you know i'm on the plane and then we get there it's like right who are we interviewing today okay write questions for these people and then andy would do the questions and stuff but um i got to meet them and i thought i've got to be you know i'm not usually that person that runs up to someone to get a signature or anything like that but i thought this is a a once in a lifetime experience i really should get photos with a lot of these people and i'm, I'm so glad i did because they're um yes yeah, really really awesome people that i got to meet yeah, yeah mark scott really cool. zickery was uh he's like the twilight zone expert i think he's like a twilight zone historian he worked on a he worked on he-man obviously the real ghostbusters one of, one of my favorite things about one of his episodes of the real ghostbusters he did like a, a parody episode of uh tv and one of the things he parodied was He-Man. He had like mm-hmm. Power Guy. <laughs> and it was, uh, and you had Peter Venkman going, the, the toy is a star of a cartoon. <laughs> it's just like the idea that Mark Scott Zickery had already written He-Man episodes and was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to mock the fact I did that. But um, yeah, working mm-hmm. on this set, and this was like all the notes and yeah, so much material. Yeah. It looks like you got like a schedule here. It looks oh. like you got the episode list here. So, yeah, you were kind of getting into this a little bit on the morning show. So take us through, um, so you, you did you do the interviews first or did you guys go looking for all the stuff for the show first? It was it was like we were literally doing everything. Like during all the day, once. yeah, it was, it was all at once. It was like we were in L.A. for, I think, five or six days. And it was like, right, we're doing yeah. everything all at once. Um, make for a great, great movie title. Um, so, yeah, it was just just there with, right, we've got, we got to hunt down the episodes um they'd already got a batch before i got there but there was still like a, a bunch missing because that was what you're talking about the one days yeah like you had some issues tracking down the rest of the show because you there said was, they didn't we, have it we, all in one place there was we we had uh, so yeah while i was there we were still getting the masters and at one point we had all of them bar two episodes one was 
Oh my goodness, I forgot one. One was definitely Ghostbuster of the Year. They were both syndicated season, um, syndicated episodes, and one was Ghostbuster of the Year. And the way they sold that, and it's not like it's not a bad thing, but they they sourced the UK DVD release, ripped the episode, and just chucked it on the on the Time Life set. Uh. Because it, I mean, it sounds terrible, but I mean, luckily, it's a relatively good. I mean, it's one of the best animated episodes of the series, but it's it was a relatively good transfer. Well, I mean, compared to all the others on that set, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong; it still doesn't fill you with confidence. But we were we were going around, and that's the thing I, I always try and explain to people. I think, you know, and you guys will know this. People have this under misunderstanding that oh, Sony own Ghostbusters, therefore. You will go in their vault or their warehouse, and there are all the episodes of the real Ghostbusters. Or there are all the original reels of the, the you know, the masters of the real Ghostbusters, the broadcast masters. There's the. No, it doesn't work like that. You go there and you say, <laughs> right, you're, you, you know, this is the Sony warehouse or whatever. What do you have? And they're like, oh, we've, we've got these. And it's just like, huh? Is that all you've got? And it's it's like, where's like, the rest? Oh. Yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Though. You guys laugh, but that was literally Andy and I were driving. And, oh, and never forget this was July of two thousand eight. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been to LA so many times. It was scorching hot, and it was one of those where it was it was cooler to be in the car than outside. And we were going through these really dirty warehouses, picking out broadcast masters and and bless the tape engineers they would we go from warehouse to warehouse going can you check they put it in is these the right ones i'm like yeah but the credits the end credits are wrong because i'd still have like a somewhat encyclopedic knowledge of the real guys mm-hmm. so i could spot the errors it's like no this isn't the right version and that was one thing i was How saying to tom before we started there was <laughs> there was um there's episodes of like the real Ghostbusters where there's two versions of the um, uh, soundtrack. So some were there, this group called Tahiti composed all these songs that were inserted into episodes when they were released home video, but when they were broadcast, they didn't have the rights, I guess, to use that music. And so what was broadcast was the Ghostbusters theme instead. Mm. So you were having to figure out which episodes we were going to put on whilst trying to figure out what we could get from whichever warehouse. And it was, it was so disorganized. And I've, I've I've said to you before in here, like when I was trying to, over the years, I've, I've been the, the filmation He-Man and She-Ra guy, just trying to find everything in one place for all those is still mission impossible. You go to these warehouses, and they'll go, oh, here's our system, our database. You're like, okay, tap. And it's, oh, someone misspelled Ghostbusters or someone has not written the word correctly. So you're trying all these different alternatives to try and find the I right matches. some of them under like real Ghostbusters, some of them are just under Ghostbusters. And yeah, like yeah, that. or, you know, <laughs> spook catchers or something. What are you even doing? This what? doesn't make sense. <laughs> spook catchers. <laughs> oh, just, man. Just terrible ideas. I and, wonder if um, that was a leftover from when, were they even sure they were going to be able to use the name in the animated version yet at that point? Or? I think there was, I think where I got spook catchers from, I think at one point, I'm sure, I may, I may, I may be wrong about this, I'm sure like when they were making the movie, probably there's a movie right, right. that's more about this, but I'm sure at one point it was like spook chases They had a bunch of different names because they weren't sure if they were going to be able to get the Ghostbuster, Ghostbuster name from yeah. Filmation of all places, believe it or not. Which you have the crossover there, but like, yeah, that's why I was wondering if they were running into some issues with the, the title for the cartoon as well, or what was going on there, because I know that was part of the, the big blow up between Filmation and Ghost and and, and the people over at uh, Columbia was that, Filmation thought they were going to get the animation rights, and when they didn't, they revamped their Ghostbusters instead, to compete well, with them. So well, it was like, one yeah. of those things when when Lou Scheimer he said like one of his regrets in terms of you know during his time anim- doing animation was he he should have pursued the cartoon rights instead he chose to you know get i guess a fun- like they got paid by columbia for the rights to use the name ghostbusters right. but what that led to obviously was um the real ghostbusters and right. i may have to apologize if i told the story before and here but i always remember um going into like the local video store and seeing on the this is like the, i was a big fan of the movie i saw the movie in the cinema and on the ground like on the ground level was the kids section and they had um uh, ghostbusters on vhs and i was like i picked it up and it was like two go- like a gorilla and two guys i was like what is this so I put it down. I didn't want that. <laughs> this is the thing I'd never seen the original live action. This was the filmation cartoon. I was like, what is this? I put it down. And then about half a year later, my dad 
said to me, oh, have you seen they're doing a Ghostbusters cartoon? And I was like, oh, it's the, I mean, I always remember saying, having this brief conversation. I was like, oh, it's the one with the monkey in. And he was like, yeah. no, they've, the green ghost is in it. And the fuck, because my dad loved Ghostbusters. He's like, no, it's the, the green ghost and the four guys. I was like, what? And then like a few days later, I saw the trailer on ITV, like our local um, station for the, you know, the cartoon. I was like, oh my goodness, they're making the Ghostbusters. And obviously there was the real Ghostbusters. And even like in a lot of the, uh, press releases in like variety and all these magazines it was like do you want the real you know if you want the guys from the movie and the ghost from the movie who are you going to call and it's like the real ghostbusters it's like <laughs> uh, nice. so filmation really didn't stand a chance with that bless them no but i know there are, don't get me wrong i know there are fans of the filmation show but someone once said to me um which do you prefer filmation's ghostbusters and i was like i love filmation it's like, which do you prefer, Formations Ghostbusters or the real Ghostbusters? I said, well, I said, I always pin it down to two stories. I said, you've got one series that has an episode where the Ghostbusters go up to the North Pole to stop a fire-breathing fire -breathing dragon um, that's drinking oil and burning the world's ice caps. I said, or you have another series where the cult of Cthulhu are going to summon one of the great gods to overtake the earth and it's this whole conspiracy theory and the necronomicon comes into play and it's like i think it's i know which one i prefer <laughs> it's, not the, <laughs> it's not the dragon that drinks oil to burn the ice caps and uh, lovecraft man lovecraft yeah. all the way yeah. all the way i mean like that, that episode <laughs> so, collect i mean too. that's one thing i do remember about ghostbusters not to, to get off the technical yeah. talk but like you know the show itself when it did air it was kind of like a precursor to Batman the animated series it felt like in a lot of way because it was the first show I remember when it started airing that it wasn't just me watching it it was me and my older cousins and my uncle was watching it's like th this is different like and that was the same thing I remember with uh you know Batman the animated series when that came yeah. out a little later because it it did play to a, a a more mature audience along with the kids audience and I think that episode you just brought up the, the Cthulhu episode it's a great example of how Ghostbusters, I think, especially in the earlier seasons, especially, oh. did a great job of playing to both adults and kids and fans of the film. So I don't know, Robert, I got to ask you as like an older fan at the time, because I'm sure you were a fan of the original movie when it came out. Was yeah. The, was the cartoon something you also checked out as well or? Not not really, only because when the cartoon hit, I, I just gotten into college. Right, right. So I didn't I didn't see a lot of it, but I did see it because it was really popular. So, you know, it was something I would always watch only because when I, you know, Saturdays, I just, or when it was on, probably caught it in syndication too. Yeah. I saw more of it and I liked the toys. And you know, this was also the first show I remember where we had both a syndicated version and a Saturday morning version. Yep. Well, it's the um, funny thing. Like when this was one of the things I got when I was working on the set, I would, I would refer to, I'd say, oh, season one and then season two and then season no and. I had like Straczynski and a few of the other writers say to me, no, 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 it was season one and syndicated. And I was like, really? There was like, yeah, there was the hmm. ABC network show and then the syndicated series, which was a, a better show because they had more, they could do more on syndic in syndication. Um, because we're in the UK, we just got the episodes chucked to us, whatever in whatever order. But yeah, it was the, 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 you had, yeah, the ABC season one, then the syndicated season, which ran, concurrently and then season two went, went back to abc and they made all the changes because this very highly yeah. rated kids cartoon needed um messing with and so it was like right yeah. Janine, yeah <laughs> and as i zoomed in there for a reason because that's also when it they switched over to slimer and the real ghostbusters and they yeah. changed it all together and it got real kitty and that's when i totally fell out because at that's, that point I mean, it was like yeah screw this uh, it's, it's yeah it's, it's, it's a it's a bummer to say, but they changed basically the voice cast. They removed like Lorenzo Music as Peter Venkman and Laura Summers Janine, and they made you know you had Dave Coulier doing Peter Venkman and he, I, I hated his read, version to be honest. His, with you. I remember reading an interview with him, and he said he based his version of Peter Venkman on Bill Murray's character Caddyshack. in um, Caddyshack. Caddyshack, like, yeah. Why would you do that voice? Like, okay, Slimer, you know, gonna do because that's that. whatever you know, and I I know, and that's what why I don't like dave couillet all that much because he's not that <laughs> not that cut great. it out <laughs> and for no reason is, is that's why because that that is like he he always did these uh impersonations and they were the worst versions of all the impersonations you know <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah so he ultimately did the the worst bill murray impersonation which was the one everybody did of course which was caddyshack and it's like yeah no the lorenzo music one was brilliant because he he captured oh. you know that that dry sarcasm that Bill Murray has perfect. without it sounding just like him. 
And yeah, also, like, it's the voice of Garfield for Pete's sake. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, we we didn't really get Garfield over here in the UK until the late eighties, early nineties. So the first time I heard Lorenzo Music's voice was for me anyway in the Real Ghostbusters. So for me, he was always, you know, Peter Venkman. Um, then one of the gummy bears, tummy gummy, I think. And then then I heard Garfield. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's Peter Venkman. And it, it realized, oh, he'd done Garfield first, but. Yeah, that voice, and they, they brought, they replaced, you know, uh, Laura Summer as Janine Mellon. She'd done this wonderful Annie Potts esque um, version of Jan well, the, the Janine character. And they replaced her with a um, very talented Kath Suse. And Kath Suse had to play the role in a more motherly way. And I mean, she was, uh, the character Janine was re written. And it, I've got the season two Bible, and it says Janine is more of a mother figure um in these uh, in this season onwards and and her and she and Sly and also like you know slimer must be more because kids associate with slimer he needs to be more he, he shouldn't be disciplined he should be part of the family and it's like that's you guys don't get it but that was i mean that's why straczynski left that's why a lot of the writers were just like yeah we're, we're going to check out now because regardless of getting a paycheck if you can't write these movie characters that they as you wanted them to be you know the fact they made like winston who had all these kind of standout episodes in the first season and syndicated season. It's like, oh, he's going to now be the guy that drives Ecto-1. It's like, does he have any other role? It just, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, we got to make Ray Stance slim now? That was another funny, voice that yeah. changed too. They also took yeah. out Arsenio Hall as uh I mean, Winston. I think, I don't think that was a replacement. I, well, I mean, uh, Buster Jones took over Arsenio's yeah. role. I think was that, that was just because he left? And, uh, he I think, you know, like that was just when his career was starting exactly, to blow up. So yeah. I, I think he was just like, I'm going to check out now. And, and it's, But I always, I always like to say that initial voice cast, we had Maurice LaMarche, Frank Welk, uh, uh, Lorenzo Music, Laura Summer, um, Arsenio Hall. Is that, is that all five? But yeah, that, yeah, that was just like a fantastic voice cast. So good. Yeah. Well, just Maurice LaMarche alone, Lorenzo Music, and... You know, Frank Welker are basically gods in the in the voice actor <laughs> realm. So, like, just those guys alone. But like, yeah. So let's let's get back to your yeah, photos sorry, here. Yeah. You've got no, no, no. Uh, this is the thing is, and we learned this the last time we had Robert out trying to. We got to dive back into stuff with Robert too because you guys got so much to talk about and so much going on. So, like, this is more of the interview process. I'm assuming here. Yeah, this was um, so. This is Everett Peck who designed a lot of mm -hmm. the season one ghosts. So there's the yeah. boogeyman and um, the it's demon Watt. Is one of most terrifying things. Yeah, you see, I mean, those were his original sketches. So what they what they had, what Andy Mangles had set up was, we'll interview them. But what we'll also do um, as an extra on the DVDs is uh, the process of animation. So from script to screen. Mm -hmm. So what you had was Everett Peck like to do a monster design kind of thing, just to show, well, this is how I do a monster design. You had uh, Gabby Payne here was the lead character designer on the real Ghostbusters. So the reason Egon has blonde hair, the reason Janine has that wicked cowlick, the reason all those characters look that way is because Gabby Payne um, created them that way. Um, and Gabby did like a Slimer illustration. It was just all these wonderful, this process that Andy had created. That but, yeah, Slimer was, picture right there is probably one of the most famous images of him. Yeah, too, that's one of the... I think that's the one they used on the uh, uh, Ecto coolers as well, if I'm not mistaken. I think, yeah, right, I think actually, it is. Yeah. Yeah. The Janine pose there, you can see in the, in the on the model sheet pose, where she's got her arms folded. That's the one they used when they redesigned her. And in the notes, um, they basically said, we need to make her <laughs> so bad, less slutty and prettier. And it's wow. just like, oh my god! <laughs> like not to not to do a, a bit of a sales pitch here, but this weekend I've got a um, YouTube video <laughs> going up, which is a lengthy deep dive into the whole Janine devolution, as I call it. So you get to see all that behind the scenes documentation and material where basically Deke or ABC, I should say, had this company come in and tell them how to make a better cartoon. It's like Slimer needs to talk, Janine needs to be a motherly figure, they need to be more of a family, and it's like you don't. Did you even watch the movie? But no. it wasn't. That's obviously not. They, they didn't care about that. It was all about yeah. you know that thing. But yeah, stuff like this. This was um, illustration by I think that was John Calamente. I believe it's like it's from Sandman it. episode. That's the sand. Yeah, Mr. Sandman dreaming a dream. It's just like a lot of his concept artwork. The one of the Ghostbusters heads. That's like one of the earliest designs. So that's like the redesigned Peter that, Bankman. Is heads. that one this year you were talking about? Yeah. Uh, the, the model sheet as well, but yeah, that's the. This was an illustration by Gabby Payne, and there was like three people worked on this illustration. But yes, the, yeah, this is one of the more famous ones too. But they changed yeah, the design I, of Peter clearly, and Ray as well. Ray at the oh, uh, yeah. left there. 
He's got yeah. they they gave him the uh, the ginger hair, I guess, and they gave Peter Venkman the, yeah, uh, the final got cut off there, but yeah. But yeah, it's a really nice uh, piece. And then it's just this is me being artistic. I was just like, I'm going to take a photo <laughs> from over here and show you <laughs> how much light is being projected on people. There's some more oh, of them. This guy's surname, I could never quite get it right. It was Dear Dad um, Aghamalian, I believe his name was. Mm. He was he sadly no longer with us. He passed away um, a few years after this. But he was like a, so fun to just chat to. And he, he clearly, Ghostbusters one of many shows he worked on. But he was like one of the color key guys on the show. Right. So he was just showing us how to paint cells. Mm. And it's, you know, you can oh, anyone can paint the cell. But when you see like a professional... Yeah. painting the cell and knowing how to layer it and everything you're like oh that's that's actually quite special this this guy is a paid professional <laughs> it's yeah. just really sweet oh that was gang of seven had a bunch of posters up and i was a big fan of secret wars as a kid so i was like i'm taking that because it's that's the uh the one with kitty pride on as well on the bottom left there who wasn't yeah. in the comic so i was just like i'm gonna take a photo of that there's a this was the finished painting carol who was like background. a background artist on yep. on the show and, uh, some more interviews here. Yeah, Pamela Hickey and Dennis McCoy. They're like a, I don't know if they, I don't believe they were married, but they were like a double act. It was hilarious to be around them. Like they, they'd write, they'd written a load of Ghostbusters episodes together. Uh, I think they mm. worked on a bunch of other shows, writing as a, a partnership. But they were just, mm. it was just really weird to watch them act together or be together. Like not in a horrible way, just like oh, they're very right. spontaneous. There's Andy Mangles on the right and the the camera guy was uh, oh, i think his name was reed kaplan was the cat he was a really really lovely guy both we can't both see his face anyway <laughs> <laughs> just like yeah, cover it up um there's me and uh len jansen who was who was one of the lead but he was like the, they were the, he was one of the two guys him and uh chuck menville wrote the um season one series bible and then the season yeah. two series bible this was this is such a dorky moment and it only gets dorkier from here so hope this is right up your street no, so no we're, got, this is, like I said, we're in the nerdiest corner of the internet right now. <laughs> Welcome, nerds. You're in the right um, place, trust me. So on the left there, it always says me, but uh, with longer hair. Um, but down below, you got Dan Reber who and Kevin Altieri on the right. And Kevin Altieri and Dan Reber worked on Ghostbusters. They went on to work on um, Batman the Animated Series and find, I think, great success on that. But so we, the, for the longest time in the Ghostbusters community, I was always in and out of it. I was primarily in the He-Man and She-Ra on my community. But we'd always seen clips, only clips, of the three and a half. Well, we didn't even know how long it was. Like the Ghostbusters pilot, it was the animation of the Ghostbusters in their original uniforms. Peter Venkman, different head. Slimer, the sizzle reel or whatever it was called. Yeah. Sizzle reel, and and Slimer is the bad guy, so he's technically still the onion head. And it was just like I'm the first time I ever saw it was the weirdest thing. I'm at school, and this this you know school always had fads go around crazies. And there was this fad, you know, the old Viewmaster, you know, do you remember the Viewmasters? You put the yeah. reel in and oh, yeah. these things for a while, which were like little mini film reels. And you plug it in and it was battery operated. And you'd hold it up to the light, no sound, just press the button and you'd hear the audio. Uh, sorry, you'd, you'd see the visuals play. And my, there were two reels my friends and I had. And it was Ghostbusters. It was like, what is this? We couldn't figure out why they were all in there original colored uniforms and peter venkman looks different because we're all big fans of ghostbusters and we couldn't figure out why they look different internet comes along made oh we're never going to get to see this you go back to that photo of the, not you don't have to but i'm saying that photo where dan reba and kevin altieri are there kevin altieri walks in with this um leather like yeah leather case or whatever and He's like, I've got something in here you guys might want. And we're like, oh, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's the Ghostbusters pilot I directed. We're like, what? I was like, you you have the pilot? And he's like, yeah, I've got the storyboard as well. So he pulls out the storyboard first and looking through it. And like like Dan Reber is going through it going, oh, I remember this. And I think he'd st Kevin Altier had, had storyboarded it with the guy. Now, if I Edith remember, they actually did air this on television. What it was shown yeah, on was this brief. preview thing for the upcoming fall television shows. Because that's the first yeah. time I remember seeing it, yeah. Yeah, it definitely aired. But, yeah, I mean, like in the UK, we definitely didn't get it. And it was, I think, it made its way to, like, a blockbuster VHS where they just show, like, a little 30-second clip where it's For like a promo together. thing, yeah. But, yeah, it was just, it had never been found. And, D and Dan Reber's, like, going through the storyboards, and I was just, like, standing there in awe, which is, I think, why Andy took that photo, because I looked like such a dork. I was just like, oh, I can't believe you got that. So this is how it even it got even dorkier, because I went back to the hotel 
And I had the tape and I was like, oh my God. And we had a VHS player. Andy had bought one, a VHS to DVD recorder. So yeah, the Ghostbusters promo, I was like, am I going to be like the first person to watch this in decades? And I put it in. And I mean, like I said, I took so many photos watching this, even though I was recording it. But I was geeking out because this to me was a, a vital piece of Ghostbusters history. This show I love to see it at this early stage was just, yeah, utterly phenomenal. Um, yeah, it was it was just incredible. I was, I was geeking. I was like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. And like when I, you know, social media wasn't that prevalent in 2008. It was still in its, I guess, infancy. I remember just tell, telling a few people, I was like, the Ghostbuster pilot is going to be on the DVD release. Everybody was like, what? It was it was nuts. It was just, you never thought we were going to see that. And it suddenly... So it's like it a is. holy grail discovery. I got to imagine. Really, it really was. It really was. It and was Robert, so I, I know that kind of reminds me of some of the things you were talking about when you were searching for Star Trek stuff and whatnot, too. I got to imagine it was the same kind of thing, uncovering things that you hadn't seen in a long time or never saw before. Oh, I, yeah. I mean. Like you that know, recent I, thing you uh, showed, the, the video effects thing like you showed when you were here and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, like like we were so like James was saying, when you suddenly start looking for things a lot of people don't know what they even have and right. they don't know they don't know if something is important or not and especially when you go like working on star trek i would ask for things um you know famously there was an episode of star trek the next generation i've talked about this before called the most toys mm -hmm. and in it the um david rapperport the little person from england who played the leader of the time bandits in the movie Time Bandits, um, he shot for one day on that episode as Kivas Fajo, the the alien, and then he tried to take his own life the next day. He shot on a Friday, and wow. he tried to kill himself on Saturday, so he was replaced with Saul Rubinick. And when we were working on the Next Generation, you know, we had all the negative. They had gone back in and got all the negative. So I had written to the people at CBS Digital, and I said, "Yo." Um, for this particular episode, you might come across some negative that no one's ever touched and no one's ever done anything with it. It probably doesn't even have the proper paperwork or whatever, but I would imagine the negative and sound, you'll come across it. And if you do, could you send it to me? And so CBS Digital, they didn't know what it was. So they sent it to me. They took the negative and they transferred it in 2K synced up the, the audio and wow. they sent it to me no one had ever even back when this episode was shot in the third season which was the let's see 87 88 88 89 the 89 90 season mm. no one had ever looked at this negative it had never been looked at ever and wow. not only that it didn't even have the sag paperwork that showed that <laughs> yeah. david rapaport worked on the episode so essentially wow. so i get it and i was able to edit it together and I even comped in effects. So there's scenes that were shot on the view screen that Picard was looking at, that they were in a, uh, opposing ships. And I comped that stuff on the view screen over the original footage from the episode. And no one had touched it, you know. And I sent it to the studio for approval because we had, you know, the legal department. I'm sure James would know you have to, you have to, all this stuff has to get approved by somebody. They freaked out. They're like, what is this? And I, they're like, because they, nobody knew, first of all, nobody even knew that this footage existed. And then when I explained, they're already freaked out. And then when I explained what it was, they got, they went nuclear. They were like, you, and I said, look, man, this is because it was a different alien makeup and it was a different uniform. So here was an alien design that no one had ever seen. Um, there really weren't any photographs. I think there might have been one photograph of it or something. And here's everything that this this was the oh, David Rappaport succeeded in taking his own life a couple months later. So yeah, this was right. the last thing that ever existed of this man. That's and, nuts. and I was of course the answer that you get from the answer to the, the studio's answer to everything is no, you can't do that. It's always no. It's no because nobody wants to take the time, even though it should be yes. But the attitude is they would rather err on the side of caution and not get in trouble. Right. And I, I, I said, look, why don't why, let's call his next of kin? You know, and it was 25 years later or something. And, and nobody wanted to do that. And I'm like, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, so the, the lawyers that we were working with, they ended up making the call. And it was these two women and they were great. Oh. Um, Trisha Gum was one of them. And we, we 
they 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 um and the next of kin the, his family said this was the last thing that he ever did as an artist and as an actor and no one's ever seen it and how great would it be yeah, so, that's amazing. That's like preserving a piece of his life. And it's just. Yeah. Really, and, and yeah. But you never know. I mean, whether it's animation, like you said, you finally got to see this pilot you were looking for. You know, you never know. I mean, here's the thing the only people that are going to be interested, the fact that you were such a fan and got to work on this project, when it comes to what you were doing, it's a godsend because. If you're not a fan, no one who gets hired for the job, unless they're totally passionate about this stuff, is ever going to do the work that a fanatical fan will do. Yeah. They just won't do it. You, and and because people get hired and they want to get paid by the hour. Yeah. And there's a, there's a difference between, first of all, you have to have fanatical fans that are also professional. Yes. And they're terrified to hire fans. You know, people always ask, the problem with hiring fans to work on any IP, whether you're going in and doing documentary work and resurrecting things, doing a little bit of archaeology to finding these things, the problem is fans don't know how to work as professionals. Not all fans, and I'm sure some people can step mm -hmm. up, but when you're working with a studio, you have to pretend, even though you're like, we're on Star Trek, we were fanatic. Like they had no idea the depths of our fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to keep it that way. Because then people get scared because then they're like, well, if you, are they going to abscond with all this stuff? Are they going to return it back to the studio? They get weird about. So yeah. you have to always keep it professional. But if you're a fan, you're the mm -hmm. only one that knows to look for this stuff. Like nobody else. I mean, maybe they could have hired somebody other than Roger and myself to do this, but nobody else would have made, gone the extra mile right. because nobody else would have one known or two cared. And so what you guys did on, on the Ghostbusters here and finding, I mean, when you got, what was it like when you finally heard that you got to hear, you're going to see this pilot and you're going to see the storyboards? I mean, that, I mean, is that one of those moments where you're like, oh my God. Well, yeah, I mean, like I say, it was, it was just, you know, that, that I, I didn't expect that was going to happen. We were working on the set. We knew Kevin Altieri was going to come in, but he didn't say, I'm bringing something with me. He's right. just like, I've got something you might be interested in. Like you said, it's that thing of, Sometimes they don't know what they have. And he opens right. up this this leather thing and there's the storyboard. And I was just like, oh, so we're not only going to get to see the pilot, here's the storyboard for it as well. Like, you, see, you know, storyboards, in animation, you can find them if you, if you search hard enough. But to find the storyboard for the pilot as well, it was it was, my, it was jaw dropping. I was, you know, yeah, I, I took this photo. I remember that because I was just like, I want to take this just in case I never see it again. Of course, I'm going to see it again. <laughs> they were going to scan it, but you were just in that. I remember my heart racing. It sounds really uber nerdy, but this was to me, you know, with animation, uh, I can appreciate where you're coming from with the whole Star Trek thing. It's you, the, well, I got um, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just gonna say, you, you, you come across these you know, holy grails kind of thing and things that sometimes you didn't even know existed or you had a vague idea. And it's just like, I, we're going to get to see this. Like there are a few pilots still out there that I'd love to get my hands on. But over the years, you know, the, the stuff I've uncovered for He-Man and Ninja Turtles and a few other things, it's like, yeah, that, that's, you know, you ask the right people, you make the right connections. And it's not self-serving. You just, I've always, with my whole career in, you know, <laughs> in animation, his, you know, uh, unearthing all that stuff i've always just wanted to get it out there to the people not you know breaking any rules but just like you want to see the he-man series bible here it is you want to see the real ghostbusters storyboards for this here it is you know because this stuff it showcases like the hard work of people like this storyboard would have just sat in you know kevin altieri's uh cupboard or something he does the work he gets paid for it he enjoys what he sees but then it's just like left there and you think no no this stuff needs to be archived and you know whatever maybe i'm going off on one there but i i, I truly believe that you know there's there's always going to be fans for this stuff and so when this pilot was unearthed the the ghostbusters community went crazy because like we're going to get to see this and then yeah weirdly uh, um, about i'd say 10 years later another fan <laughs> this was so random um i can never pronounce his surname it's like robert barbary I might get is this really the 16 quick. millimeter version or whatever there you go yeah he he just stumbled upon it and he was like i've got something here that just says ghostbusters promo i think it's the pilot and i was like no and, and sure enough he found the, the actual reel and he got it digitally transferred he went through the right channels um and got it you know put didn't they the show it at one of the ghostbuster celebration things i think they might have done but i it, think it was well, just before uh um 
Ivan Reitman passed away too, I think. Yeah, they. Um, I know for a fact that they got it put on the. He got it like officially put on the Ghostbusters website. Um, right. Cause yeah, because I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, Robert said to me, "Do you want to like help um, restore?" Because Robert painstakingly went through every frame, removing dirt and stuff, which would have, I mean, like, uh, three and a half minutes. But all those frames, and there was a lot going on in that in that promo. But um, yeah, I was just like, I don't have the time at the moment, which I couldn't. I was doing some He-Man stuff or something. But uh, it's just stuff like that. It's he just uncovered that. And I, I, one of the most recent things you guys probably are aware of this was. Um, one of my favorite animes is this one from 86 called Project Aiko. Mm -hmm. For the longest time, Project Aiko had always had like really crappy DVD releases. And this company were going to release a Blu-ray and they were going to upscale, I think, the DVD. And they'd done a pretty good job. And then someone stumbled upon like one of their, I guess, workers or, or friends stumbled upon the original Project Aiko reel that had technically been lost for th nearly 40 years because someone had mislabeled it. And you think that's all it takes to lose this stuff. Like a, an hour and a half piece of anime history is just sitting in a vault because someone mis mislabeled it. But someone happened to check it one day and go, this is Project Aiko. And it's just stuff like that. I just find fascinating. You wish everything was in order and easy to access, but sadly life isn't like that. Yeah. What happened to the VHS, the the promo VHS? Oh, that, that went back to Kevin Altier. We we you know I I as soon as we got it, like I said, I watched it once and sat there like <laughs> like I was in love with the TV screen, like that's uh, so pretty. And then um, <laughs> I, I watched it a second time and just immediately recorded it to the highest quality DVD I, I could. Say, and then, had to make a copy. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, that was that was the thing. It wasn't like uh, I was doing anything the far as they like Kevin was well aware. I was right, like, right, right. I'm gonna make right, yeah. Like, yeah, go for it. And we made the You're going to have to transfer it to digital either way. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's going to have to happen. Although so, on that note, yeah, like, I th no, no, I was just going to say, I think that's a good spot where we can kind of get into because I know that's one thing I know the guys in the, ch the chat are going to want to know about because, of course, Robert talked a little bit about, you know, how they remastered TNG, but he luckily had access to the negatives and stuff like that. Those guys did to put that together. You guys didn't necessarily for Ghostbusters. So, how much no. were you a part of the actual remastering in quotations of the of the show and and how it made it and, and kind of take us through what 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 you can played we, can we use the biggest oh. road quotations like like this yeah thing. i did actually do quotes even though you can't see me which is funny <laughs> um so yeah i mean these were all broadcast masters as yeah. simple as that and they, they i think they they did that like, they would show me and everything else yeah they would show me every once in a while and say like oh here's the intro what do you think and i'm like yeah, it looks clearer because before then we just had like literally um, uh, what do you call it? Magic Window VHS releases or PAL UK re releases. So we didn't have exactly the best, you know, it's just VHS tapes. And not there's anything wrong with that. Obviously, we love a good bit of VHS. But seeing them on D DVD, it was like, oh, okay, the quality is there. And then over the years, the more you revisit, you're like, oh, they are just broadcast masters, aren't they? And especially some of those later seasons, you have like, field issues and as we were talking before we started recording you've got speed issues and that was something else entirely um but the the digital process like i i did my best to say you know i i, I going through my notes last night before we, we like i said i've got them all in the zip file and i found i qc'd as many episodes as i could because i i was for a few years i was a professional qc I would, I would get paid to watch dvds blu-rays whatever and spot digital errors and sometimes i was the stuff i would put catch was pretty <laughs> awesome to the point where i've still got a few of the catches on uh, saved to my computer but the um with that i was i was kind of speed QCing and listening for any audio dropouts and any graphical dropouts i would flag up and i i, I looked at this list i was like god i spotted about like 60 errors during that that process so it like i say there's every chance it could have been a lot worse, but the, the thing I was trying to do was just make sure that we had the right intro, the right end credits, the right music tracks. And it was, but at the same time, I'm, you know, writing questions, helping do this and trying and doing trivia because I wrote the booklet as well. So I was doing trivia for the things. And at the same time, um, one of the people I met in one of the photos, Marsha Goodman, who was the voice director for the Real Ghostbusters, lovely woman. She, she turned up and she was like, I've got all these call sheets if you want them and i was like oh my god and infamous infamously famously whatever the real ghostbusters never credited anyone but the main cast mm. so you went through all these call sheets and you were like oh my god there's so now these... you know who did all the other voices besides like, the main cast yeah um uh who was the the father of the arquettes lewis arquette 
I was like, Louis Arquette was in this show? Oh, wow, All yeah. these different so many different actors i mean you could still catch them james avery was in uh, you know the shredder uncle phil was in an episode or two and it's seeing all those see so i was i was kind of doing that doing this doing that and also going through all these call cool sheets and listing all the uncredited oh, cool. actors as well it's just like uh, my brain's gonna melt but it was it was you know i did the end result I no but we nobody did. would ever know if you hadn't done that though james that's the thing because that would have just sat in a file somewhere and I mean, like, Marsha Goodman, you, again, it's one of those things. Kevin Altieri turns up with the Ghostbusters promo. You guys may want this. Marsha Goodman turns up and says, here's copies of all my call sheets, you know, from 1986 to 1991, I think, is when they stopped recording. Mm. And it was amazing because you, you saw the progression of career, not pr progression of careers, but you saw how in the late 80s how really busy Frank Welker got. Because it's right. like, Frank Welker will be recording his dialogue another day you know it's like everybody else is there but frank welker's not everybody else is there frank welker's not and um but yeah like marsha just turned up with all these calls she's like this is this is fantastic this really helps to shape this and then i scanned them all in a few years later um one of the ghostbusters websites were like do you mind if i put these up and i was like no go for it i think this information should be out there more than just in a little dvd booklet so yeah all that stuff's kind of out there Although I said mm. remove the signatures because I don't think you should you really want people's signatures right. <laughs> on the call sheets out there. But yeah, so, so and this is animation G7 the outside, right? Yeah, that was Game of Seven. So yeah, they um, like a lot of exclamation people work there, ex Disney, uh, Warner Brothers. It was um, a real mix, but a really lovely place to. It was right opposite a golf course as well, so you'd come out and you'd see the hmm. sunset. And just like oh, this is very serene, and if you know mm. Los Angeles, not always the case. <laughs> So is that what the rest of the pictures are after this too? Then, uh, like, uh, oh yeah, that was, this was, oh this is Lou Scheimer's house. Okay, so I was waiting for that. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't want to jump to that yet. No, so, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so take us just a little bit through. So, what kind of process did they have? Like, did they just have a standard VHS and you plugged it into a computer? How did the whole scanning process go? And or, oh my goodness, part of I, honestly, I, do you know what I'm trying? I'm trying to remember. I should have. I should have remembered this before. Um, I think they, I mean, they were just encoding broadcast masters at like a, I think they, I don't even think they were using a variable bit rate. So I was saying, because this is pretty early on, right? Like, this yeah, was I think it was just CBR. Close I think to, just, what, 15 years ago now or more? Yeah, 2008, they were using, and I think they were using constant bit rates because when I'd asked for digital corrections visually, they were always like, it's quite problematic. And I was like, not if you use a variable bit rate, what you got to do is do that and re encode. Um, cause I used to, you know, like I say, QC'd for a living. So it was, um, yeah, all, I, as far as I know, they just broadcast master constant bit rate encode job done, which is why they got so many episodes per disc. They didn't cram them on. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like ridiculous, but you know, there's only so much they could do with those, those encodes, I think, unfortunately. Um, cause I would love to have seen, you know, I mean, what you could, I mean, Tom, you've seen me like post a few times where we've played with upscaling, and I know upscaling wasn't a thing in two thousand eight, but it's it shows you what you know could be done. Uh, but I don't know. It's one of those yeah. things you know you find with a lot of these, you know, a lot of the shows that were animated overseas. They're just quite infamously, and especially like with the real Ghostbusters, you had goodness, you had studios upon studios doing the work so the reels were going out all over the place so you think are they there i mean they should technically all be in did you guys feet. even attempt to try to track down like some 16 or 35 millimeter reels uh, to my on knowledge shows, like, i think i came in after that pro when i came in it was all broadcast master at that mm -hmm. point so i don't know if they tried but i like i'm not going to for a second think like oh they didn't bother because i know like andy put so much work into this set like of course back really, then that's what i was saying is they weren't yeah. quite to that place yet because this would even have still been the same time in the earlier versions of a lot of DVDs where we're getting where they, that's all they were was just the straight, like you said, the, the broadcast masters off the master tapes, the, the, the video tapes. That, and yeah. I was say the frustrating exception to that is always that gorgeous um, DVD set. I don't think I'll, I might bury myself with is the, uh, the Ralph, uh, Ralph Bash, the 1967 Spider-Man cartoon where. Oh, all that one looks were, great. Yeah. To this day, it's like, I still watch that. I mean, I love that show, but I'm watching like, they're so good. The quality is so good. Yeah. For the time, yeah, you're not wrong. Because, like, <laughs> this was just before, like, you're, you're probably right. That was one of the first ones they probably did go back and scan it in HD because it wasn't until they started getting a little bit down the road closer to Blu-ray when they finally did. I know, of course, Robert, that was the whole undertaking of, you know, doing TNG again is because the original release was just that, the broadcast tapes. Well, basically. that was... 
that was really always a problem. It, you know, it started to become a problem in, in the mid eighties where TV shows right. were finished on videotape. And then they even, even shot though, some sitcoms and stuff on videotape. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of most sitcoms actually were shot on, on yep. tape, you know, the three camera stuff. So they only existed as, and, and we had the worst America had America and Japan. We, we had the worst video standard, you know, NTSC video wasn't as good as pal and wasn't as good as C cam. I remember I didn't know that when I was, you know, 13 years old, 14, I was like 14 or 15. And I got two, I got a VHS tape of evil dead and a VHS tape of Dawn of the dead from England. And I didn't know that they had, like, it never occurred to me. You know, I didn't know that there was a different, the different uh, standard. And, and I put it, you know, I put in the yeah. tape and pal, I'm like, what is this? And not only that, but pal ran at 25 frames. And, and so I never actually tried to tape. Did it even work or did it just go all no. rah, 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 yeah, rah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's always been a problem. Like when you, the conversion of sound, because sound, sound would run one frame faster in, in England. So conversion uh, has been an issue, even with DVDs and uh, uh, right. Blu-rays and things like that. But but it was frustrating. It's frustrating to go back and look at. I uh, like I'm a big fan of the mid '80s Twilight Zone series that Straczynski also worked on. Yeah, uh, the third season of it, and they you know they had to fill out a syndication package, so they didn't give them very much money to do that third season. But they were all again posted on because they were shot on film. But they were posted on. They were tape. some of the earliest ones to use tape, weren't they? Uh, yeah, and they look wow. just terrible. Yeah, and the visual the visual effects were done on video toasters and things like that. Oh, so wow. they so they really don't look good. And that was that was true of of Next Gen, because Next Gen was only two years after uh, the Twilight Zone. And what happened with Next Gen is, in order to do the effects, this is crazy. <laughs> so to do the effects work, so when you when you shoot. It was all shot at like image G and the beautiful models were shot on 35 millimeter. But in order, so when you shoot a model of like the enterprise, you use a motion control camera and there's all these different passes. You have a fully illuminated beauty pass. Then you have an internal light pass where the windows are shot. Then you have a warp nacelle pass. And then you have all these different passes that are combined into one shot. And normally that would be done on an audio uh, audio printer, a, um, a optical printer, if you're going to do a negative. But what they did was they daisy chained VTRs, videotape recorders. They daisy chained a video signal so they didn't have to keep re recording it. So they could only, co they would combine all of these images in, at one time, but it was daisy chained through videotape machines. So wow. the visual effects of all the model shots and all of it was shot on film. But you didn't have very the star fields were never it was you never had real black in space it was that gauzy video black it degraded so much with all those generational daisy chains i mean yeah yeah, yeah. well that's yeah. what they didn't have they didn't want to generate it so they daisy chained it all at once so they were combining oh. it to do the best they would combine all 10 passes at one time which was in it just insane so when they went back and did the restoration what was incredible when we were when Roger and I were working on it they released a disc um, like Sins of the Father and Encounter at Farpoint, I think Inner Light. So they put out this like test Blu-ray. And when we first looked at that, it was insanity because the star fields had 20 times, it was like watching something through the James Webb telescope. And the the, the effects were crazy because they would do things like, they would shoot like uh, a cheerleader's pom-pom, you know, against black and they would shake it. And that would turn into some like an energy thing that's coming up against the the shields so they had all these crazy things that they had done to do the effects with which we hadn't seen we had all the raw effects passes that we could get and when they when they started to combine those passes and show us the finished effect shots it was a revelation i mean you're looking at something that was six times the clarity and it was so astonishing unfortunately nobody star trek fans they never really explained to people because right when the discs started coming out one they were too expensive the season discs were like 100 bucks each Ooh. and and because of how much work went into uh, production of them and then the fans streaming had just exploded and star trek was everywhere so even star trek fans were like why should i pay 100 bucks for something i already have and they didn't understand how revelatory the images were that i mean they were 
it was unbelievable to get like there's a third season episode called the enemy where jordy is helping out it's kind of like um hell in the pacific or something where jordy's helping out a romulan and they're in this dark cave and it had always looked gray and you could barely make anything out and then to see it it's full 35 millimeter resolution and the blacks were deep and black and you could see the detail. It was amazing. And unfortunately, if they were able to go back and do that with like, I can't wait to see the Fleischer, the Max Fleischer Superman. Oh yeah. disc yeah, It's coming out on Blu-ray. Yeah. You know, and, and I worked a lot on um before I did next generation, when I first started working in home video, creating special features, I worked for a company called Curdy Pellerin. And all we worked on was special features for Disney movies, for Disney animation. And the first thing I worked on was, speaking of revelatory things to find, I worked on the Fantasia anthology when this was when Fantasia 2000 came out. And there was a guy named, when they made Fantasia, there was a lot of physical effects that they used, mechanical effects that they used to create animation that they would rotoscope over. And the guy that did all these amazing effects was this guy named Herman Schulteis. And he literally went to the jungles of South America and disappeared. He was this incredible guy that worked for Disney, an early version of the Imagineer or something. And when he was finally declared dead and like his widow moved out of the house or something, they found this book, this log book, this incredible book that Schulteis had made when he was doing all the effects for Fantasia. And he had storyboards and pictures and stuff about how he did all of the effects and wow. it had never been seen before. It was like under, it was either underneath a bed or it was in a wall or something. And they found this thing. I, I forget where it was, but so that's one of those things that to find it. And then I, I did a piece on him for the first Fantasia disc, but to find this stuff again, back yeah. to what James was doing, you know, it's, it's um when you come across this stuff, it's, it's, I mean, unfortunately, as the years go by, less and less people care. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing I've been I've been saying a lot recently. Like uh, Universal, the company that owned the uh, cartoon rights to He Man and She Ra, and they, right. you know, with all respect to Universal, they really don't know what they have because no. to them, they're Universal. They're like a billion dollar company. He Man and She Ra and the Filmation Library is like probably this big compared to everything else they own. So you say to them, you know, any chance of a Blu Ray? Um, and they they're like oh yeah do we yeah we own those don't we um yeah well how do we we can't because we don't have the reels and it's just it's frustrating it's frustrating because i think people think that the corporations that own a lot of these things they just have them to hand and so don't get me wrong in some cases they do but yeah. like with the case of the real ghostbusters that was just so where is everything and it's like mm -hmm. is that warehouse that warehouse well yeah drive and... a mile down there it's like <laughs> There's no one, they've fired everybody or people have retired or left that even know right. what this stuff is. I don't know sadly if you, passed away, yeah. I don't know if you saw that what was going on at Warner Brothers last week, but at Warner Brothers last week, I've always collected movie posters and lobby cards, original stuff. Yeah. At Warner Brothers last week, they were clearing out, they had like one of the sound stages there and all they were doing was throwing away all of their movie posters, all of their, I mean, literally millions of dollars worth of original movie ad stuff. And I saw people posting pictures on nice, social media. Yeah. As a matter of fact, an executive at Warner Brothers called me and he said, hey, I, I, I got this. He got me this mint condition poster from a movie I have a particular fondness for from 1965. He just people were just going there, and I, I was like, they don't know what the fuck just, are they doing? Like, it's, just, it's just I, taking that, that up made space. Me so mad. They didn't even think to 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 auction this stuff well, off. Yeah, I mean, need of money right now. Well, because there's nobody. the The problem is there's nobody, sorry that made me very upset. I posted that too, Robert. Yeah, there's nobody at the studio yeah. that, and the problem is nobody would speak up because you don't want to lose your job. But as somebody who's collected movie posters my whole life, there's one of the greatest collection of original movie paper that i've ever seen at a place that's not 10 minutes from the front gate of warner brothers in burbank and the woman who ran it's a place called la Magerie, and this woman debbie has the single greatest collect if you want if you said to her you wanted a french you know a french quad or something from 1945 or, or from cocteau's beauty and the beast from the 40s she would find it for you it might cost a million dollars but she'd find it and 
when I had my DVD production company in the mid uh, mid aughts, I had a massive collection of of um, what I call big paper, three sheets, uh, right. six sheets. I sold it all to a company called the Third Floor. Yeah, you were talking about this last time. Yeah, yeah, and and it imagine having all of that. I mean, I, I was looking at this going, and pe- some people have posted, "Look, my friend picked me up at you know univ- at the Warner Brothers when they were purging all the stuff." I'm just I'm looking at posters like, "Well, that's five hundred dollars, and that's a thousand dollars, and that," and they just don't know and they don't care. It's just taking up space, and Ridiculous. and you could have you could have auctioned. The the problem is. There's nobody at the studio that knows this. It's just paper to them. And and they don't know. It's the same thing happened. Movie So movie posters uh, are called one sheets. Yeah. And up until 1984, all movie advertising material from the studios were made by a company called the National Screen Service Corporation, NSS. So if you look at one sheets, uh, one sheets are 27 by 41. Then they became 26 by 40 when they took away the white borders. But they're 27 by 41. And if you look at the bottom of pre-1984 one sheets, on the bottom, they all say property of the National Screen Service Corporation. And they have numbers. They had an NSS number and whatever, 475. It was the 475th movie released. So the, the National Screen Service Corporation, if memory serves, had five different outlets across the United States. And when they went out of business because the studios started taking all their marketing in-house and they made their own posters, all these National Screen Service Corporation people just threw their posters away. And I have a friend, he lives in Seattle, my friend Craig, he worked at National Screen Service and he just took as much as he could. And since I've known him, I've known him since 1984, in his apartment, he's lived in the same apartment this whole time, he has stacks of 40 by 60s and one sheets and lobby cards, full sets of lobby cards, Hitchcock lobby cards, all the way back. His lobby card collection is worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Robert, I got to tell you, I was mad enough when um, when Hurricane Katrina damaged all of my double-sided original theatricals of Ugh. the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the <clears throat> Harry Potter movies, like the first two, the Chris Columbus films, Yep. Uh, along with, uh, I had Phantom Menace, I had, I, I mean, I still have them. They don't look like they did when I got them. Like, you know, OG double-sided. Oh, I'm, I'm listening to you rattle off the the, 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 the stuff that was and those destroyed. those are all Warner Brothers. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm going. And they probably had, like, uh, I, I still have. I I'm have listening this. to the list you give, and it's, it's I'm, I'm thinking I was in a bad spot. I'm going to puke <laughs> listening to what you're reading off. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's funny because I cl- the, the only Lord of the Rings poster I kept, there were two advanced one sheets for Fellowship, and they mm. one of them, they're both the same image. It, it's Frodo with his hand out like this. Yeah, I know the one the you're talking one about. One ring, and there's one where he's looking down, and there's one where he's looking up. Mm-hmm. And my oldest friend in the world, I gave him the one where he's looking up and I kept the one where he's looking down. So, um, oh. and I just love that poster. Yeah. You know? I remember and, those. I'm used to be big, like in the early yeah, 2000s, these... mid 2000s. No. I was like, I, I collected this. I loved going look how on. old I, those I look. Websites. I, yeah. It, it, that. Okay. This, by the way, puke. this is a sound stage on the Warner lot. Yeah. And these boxes, I mean, just people are going through there. I can't really, I can't really blow it up, but you can see that there are there are half yeah, sheets in here. There's quads. There. Yeah. There's one. But they sheet. look like they're from the '60s, '70s, maybe even yeah. sooner Dude, than that. They're probably all that. And you can see that these boxes are where, like in the in the photo on the right, you can see that they probably just had all the one sheets that came out that year, because one sheets were folded into sixths. Right. You know, they were folded down the middle, and and so you because the tougher really... ones to find were the rolled up ones. Yeah, That's, they didn't roll. They yeah. didn't roll posters until. Um, that's what the, I looked for the, the, the late seventies. And the, like, you can find, I have a rolled alien one sheet. I have a, oh. rolled, I have a rolled blade runner one sheet. The bl- roll posters were hard to find, but then they Man. became rolled posters became the norm because they didn't fold them anymore. And Warner brothers was the first studio that, uh, started printing their own posters. And I want to say some of the first mm-hmm. posters that Warner brothers w- was doing on their own, like Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, which was 85, yeah. Then they had taken their posters in-house. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they used to do all like that, that stuff in house actually, and this is how I kind of know some people in that arena because they would actually do all their home video, all their distribution stuff in there, like you said. Yeah, after national screen, and then that's what put national screen out of business. And it was it, what happened too is the the whole distribution model of Hollywood changed. Like they they didn't used to release mm-hmm. movies uh, throughout the country all at once. Like the, when Star Wars first came out, I think they only released it in 35 theaters. The first movie to actually really do that was Godfather, if I remember right, to do a national release mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, they went they went all out and that was a, that was unique. And they didn't and lower budget indie movies like movies like How yeah, Dead, yeah. they would just play like Dawn of the Dead, which it might take a or year. Or even and a one half city at a time play. sometimes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so oh, this is just devastating, though. And I, I mean, yeah. oh, I can't, I can't, I can't even it's imagine unbreaking. what was in there. <clears throat> and I know, James, yeah. like, I'm going to ask you about this because this that actually reminds me of a story you told us. But Greg and, and Valiant actually have to step out here. So do check out their channels. I will be hanging out with Greg <laughs> later. But we got a few more minutes here. We got some super chats to go through yet. And I want to ask James a few more questions and stuff as long as uh, Robert can hang out too for a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, thanks Always for being here, guys. You guys, sorry, I was a little late, Valiant. No, 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 that's I'm, fine, I'm, man. I, look, this was I was I was saying backstage, and I know I had a couple of unexpected phone calls I had to take care of come in, but I was I was watching and listening the whole time. It's been a pleasure to sit here. It's been fascinating to listen to this. Um, well, I knew after we got through our first talk with and, Br- Rob, I'm like, this is not going to be a one show thing. No, I told this is this is not. It's like <laughs> we're, so, we're so used to me being at, at this day and age, you know, about an hour long. We cover the news stuff and I'm like, look, I, I brought my disc tonight. This is what you I covered. Add some I, I watched so you want to do that real sun. quick. I did Puss in Boots. Yeah. By the way, All Tom, the Western to, front looks great. You. Oh, you God, know? yes. I got both of them, too. I got my <laughs> Dragon Slayer. By <laughs> the way, this 4K, did you watch this? It looks great. It I have a banger. I was it not a big banger. Flash Dance fan, but I'd be curious. You know what? Come I on, might. Man. I, it's I, not the greatest movie. It's not, but it's one of those things. It's one of those things, Robert, that I would actually be tempted to buy. right? To like, let me go back. I haven't watched it in probably oh god, twenty years. I'd oh, watch the it again music in alone makes it worth it. Man. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a yeah. silly, it's a silly movie. But what's really interesting about it is Adrian Lyne directed it, who went on and directed like Nine and a Half Weeks and Fatal Attraction and Jacob's Ladder, and it has mm-hmm. it, the cinematography is incredible. I mean, the story is a simple s- s- romance, but what's really interesting yeah, it was is it was the, a chick, is, it was kind of a chick flick for me. It's like I totally. loved everything else about it. The, you're right. The cinematography, the, 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 look, the look of it's incredible. Was, You've got oh, this yeah. early <laughs> early hip hop dance crew that dances at, at one point in it. But what's amazing about it is Giorgio Moroder <laughs> did the score, and yeah. the music is it's the most '80s score in the world. But it's, I see you, Chad. It's, it's really, really <laughs> looking at it in four K. I was like, I was blown. I got to give Paramount some credit, Robert, because I actually have had Flash Dance on digital 4k for two three years now Mm -hmm. and that looked like crap compared to this oh of course you have the and what i'm talking about is they must have went back and oh it's dolby vision yeah whatever scrubbing they had done then they undid now and went back and went back to the source and yeah it it, it, rebuilt it up or whatever because i heard they got a new i don't remember who it was i think you were telling me robert there's somebody over new over paramount overseeing some stuff or somebody did and I'm kind of happy about it because you're kind of seeing a little bit of be- a bit of an uptick uptick in the quality since the last few releases. Because Generations, for instance, looks fucking amazing. Oh yeah, mm. it's amazing. <laughs> Better than the movie deserves. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're gonna make me want to go back and buy that one. I've got the I've got the six stick. The worst the of those bunch is Nemesis, and I think that's just because of <laughs> really? the time when they shot it and, and some yeah. of the digital effects and all that See, kind of I, stuff. But yeah. I can still sit down and watch Nemesis because I, I I'm a big Tom Hardy fan. I don't care. Uh, I I, well, I just, he, he's great him. in the movie. He is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> he, he was but just look wise. Yeah. It's like the, of the bunch of the four oh. that just come out. That's the one that suffered, I think, the most from the time period it was shot in and how they did all the digital effects and, and scanning and stuff then. But yeah, yeah. well, what, what's crazy is like, I did the special anyway, features for Valley girl, which is also Take celebrating care, its 40th anniversary. I'll see you guys later. Take yeah. Care. And aren't they doing some yeah. screenings for that too, Robert? I saw. Yeah. At the Chinese here in LA, they're showing Valley girl. And it was funny because we did the special features for the 20th anniversary of Valley girl, which was 20 years ago. And then yes. Yeah, wow. Shot shout factory, scream factory, and our, our special features were quickly, they put out a special edition and it quickly went out of print. And then our special features were gone. That's another thing, James, when 
you know, I've, I've worked on special features for movies and then I have spent months doing them and then they'll go out of print and they'll re-release it in a different format because they can't find the masters for the special features that we did. And then the special features disappear. Oh, so cool. the one that I have now doesn't have your stuff on it is what you're saying? Well, Did no, you the the, when they, when, the when, Shout, disc or? <clears throat> when Shout Factory put it out, they put out Valley Girl, what, two or three years ago? Yeah, not, not that long ago. Cause, yeah, they I found got it, all yeah. of our special features. Oh, okay, and good. they put it out. Uh, and oh, Kino okay. Lorber, you know, we did The Usual Suspects before Valley Girl, and The Usual Suspects came out in 2002. And for the 20th, for the, well, for the, it was 20 years later, when Kino Lorber did the new transfer, they found all of our special features and wow. they, they put them out. So our special features were not available for 20 years. That's crazy. It's almost like the special features are becoming as uh, kind yeah. of... <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and that's what's happening to a lot of this, James. Like, I mean, and you might know this too, because I think when Mill Creek took over for a lot of the Ghostbusters stuff, they removed a lot of the special features. Now, if you got the one special box set that I got, they're still on there, but like... A lot of the stuff you would have worked on, I believe, was excised completely yeah, out of like the picture. Yeah, like Mill Creek when they did the um, the He-Man box sets. I remember because a lot of the people from BCI went over to Mill Creek, or it might have even been like a rejigging of the company or something, and they, mm. they became like a budget release company. Yeah. And, yeah, they just – it was rather than – and I get it. Rather than releasing all these special features, it's just a few, which is yeah. really bizarre that the German Blu-ray has all of those <laughs> BCI features – back in it's like wow I mean, the germans are really good about that you know they oh we the love German our german media books and they all the stuff that they do they, they um, recently they they went out of their way to um they, they republished and remastered all these german masters of the universe comics and it's just the amount of effort they go to like commissioning new painted covers by the original artists and stuff it's just like oh the germans most of my good favorite work. blu-rays come from germany <laughs> yeah oh, really? well well, yeah, I mean the the I just uh, Dieter, my the guy that I broadcast with every week, just got me the the German version of Phantasm in four K. I wanted to get that man. How's it look? I, I, I don't have it yet. He hasn't. It. Yeah. Okay. He hasn't given it to me. And the one thing, I know I can't get it imported. No, and J.J. Abrams actually paid for that restoration of wow. Phantasm. He's a huge Phantasm fan. So you know, as much as I bag on his Star Trek movies and Star Wars <laughs> movies. Kudos to J.J. Abrams for spending his own money to get Phantasm restored in 4K. But, you know, what's what I think is really interesting, it's I, there's a you're, we in America do not consider like the last Ghostbusters or even He-Man comics or anything like that art. We don't we don't have Europeans and I think the rest of the world, Asia as well, um, they take pride in the fact that you're preserving art. We in America, our, even our graphic arts, our comic arts, were not considered a real art form until fairly recently. And that's why, you know, you see the French do a incredible, you know, mo that you've got Mobius and you can go yeah. get incredible, beautiful reproductions, the humanoids press out of France and all, all the all the work that is done, you know, animation. We just we don't Americans just don't have that mindset. We don't have it our pop culture is entirely disposable and unfortunately yeah there's big there's fans of it but if you really look at the fans of today they're fans of only our big franchises there's very few young people especially that are growing up that are friends fans of niche franchises there's always going to be people that delve into those things but for the most part if unless you're talking about star wars marvel no one cares and, and it, that's it's, it's unfortunate but it's it's the kind of thing like when you when you were growing up, um, you you have to have this the idea that this stuff is important instilled in you when you're young, yeah. because if 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 not, you, you're never gonna it's never gonna matter to you, you know. And and that's in Europe though when you're surrounded, you 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 have a museum culture, you know. You, you when you have cities where you can go to a pub that's 1,200 years old and drink in a 1,200 year old building, we're lucky if we have a 10 year old building. And if we had a <laughs> If we had a 12 year old building, they're like, that's old. Like, we got Tara a 10 year old town. business anymore, man. Yeah, build build something new. I mean, we don't, unless you're in one of our, like, you're in New Orleans or Boston or Washington or Philadelphia or New York or something, we don't, we don't have that mentality here. And this is, this isn't a criticism of Americans, but, but uh, Americans are, we're the kind of people kind of that tend to look forward. 
I mean, now we have a lot of, you could say, our political pe- political structure. People are looking back to the good old days. I would right. maintain there were never any good old days. What good old <laughs> days were there? We were always in the midst of some kind of strife in this in this co- country. But we you, we don't have that mentality to save this stuff. It's like, oh, you've got all these old movie posters. Let's just throw them away. Because, because at the studio, they're like, well, who cares? Who cares it's that there's just posters? Paper. For, yeah, it's just paper. They're movie ads. Room. Yeah, that's I'm exactly gonna... what it is. Just to jump on your point, though, where you were talking about, you know, the, the corporations, what I do find interesting about that is obviously, yeah, the, the big corporations, you know, I'm not saying I understand why they do it, but we know why they do it. It's like, oh, let's just get rid of all these movie posters. Who cares? Right. I've, I've seen similar things with not necessarily private collectors, but so I've, I've talked about it before. It's like something I could talk about at length, but I'll try and keep it brief. But the um, all the all the animation art that was used to, you know, make all the filmation shows from Archie to He-Man to... You, you're funny, talking I was like actually going to get to this. Animation or... Yeah. Well, yeah Film- Filmation's warehouse was located in... Um, where was it? Just in the, in, in the Valley, Los Angeles. Yeah. So I, I first went over there in 2001. I went into the warehouse. And the warehouse wasn't like you would go in there. Um, it wasn't a shop. It was the warehouse that all the filmation... It had gone to uh, uh, um, an art... I guess, dealer owner called Herman Rush. And he had this company, I guess, in the 90s called um, Animation Fine Art or something, which yep. rebranded to Sunday Funnies. And all this animation art, all this filmation art, was it was it was as it was still in boxes that had been sealed since filmation had closed their doors in 89. So it went to this warehouse and I was paying stupid money. I mean, you know, I say stupid money. I got, I was able to cherry pick. So I'd, I'd go through a box and was like, oh my God. It's, and I, I've got all the production codes for He-Man episodes and she episodes in my brain. So I go like, right, I need to go to episode 41. And get all the scenes yep. audio, going through all these folders, going through them, going like, oh my God. And it was fa- it was fantastic. And I've always said, like my friend who got me into the warehouse, a guy named uh, Lee Clevenger, huge animation art collector, like used to know Lou Scheimer as in, I think Lee went to Filmation when they were closing their doors because he realized it was just down the road. It was, I think it was when they were in Canoga Park. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was their last location. And he, he went in there and he said there was just like all this paper over the floor. Imagine like an, as, a, as an animation studio starting to empty. And he said they were, he walked along and he went and met Lou, Lou Scheimer. was like, come in, sit down, have a chat. And I was just like, oh, that's so awesome. Got to chat to Lou Scheimer. Um, and he would introduce me to Lou years later. But Lee was the first person to get into that warehouse. He got me in. And Lee and I used to joke that if we'd been in charge of that warehouse, we could have made, it sounds, I don't mean to be kind of cutthroat about this, we could have turned it into a very profitable bit, profitable business and got the artwork into the right hands, as in the fans. The problem is when Sunday Funnies first kind of started selling He-Man and she art, they were selling each cell for like $300 a piece on just a laser copy background. It's like, these aren't even very good sales that you're selling on your website. Right. So anyway, I get into the warehouse and I start cherry picking. I was like, I want this scene. I want that scene. I paid a fortune for them. Um, and eventually I did end up like getting a lot of those, that artwork through working on the brand officially. They would say, do you want to go to the warehouse and just sift through it? I was like, okay. Or you'd go to a warehouse. You talk about the warehouse weird distribution. I went. I once went to a warehouse when I was working on the official He-Man YouTube channel. They said... Um, Oh, there's a warehouse out just outside of London that's got some what did they call them lobby art and I was like lobby art and I'm like, oh, this I, I was the story I was going to ask you about yeah oh sorry yeah they, they um no no they no said, you got to it naturally so there you go. <laughs> and they said we got this um this animation art this 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 lobby art and I was like lobby art and I was like okay he managed your lobby art and I get there and they start pulling out these boxes I was like, I was like oh my god these are the ones that used to be in the warehouse in Los Angeles now. The story of the Los Angeles warehouse that I went there a couple of times in LA, then the collection moved to San Diego. When it was in San Diego, the owner, I won't name his name, but he's a very sweet guy, but he's also someone that just likes to turn a quick profit. So he got all this animation art in and the things he did, and I would plead with him not to do this. So I was... Lee, when the animation had been in Los Angeles, Lee Clevenger, who I mentioned before, he was able to get a lot of the iconic backgrounds of like Castle Grace, all these gorgeous, beautifully hand-painted panoramics. Managed to get a lot of those. When the when the collection went to San Diego, um, Steve, uh, they said his name, <laughs> the owner. Like I said, he would 
try and turn it for a quick buck. So what he would do is take these gorgeous panoramic backgrounds that you would see sell on eBay these days for like four or five hundred dollars a piece. And he would get a guillotine and just just chop them into like 12 fields and just sell them. The problem is when you chop a panoramic in the 12 fields, you're basically almost like you're manipulating the acetate. So all of these 12 fields now, all these former pans are just ruined. And it's yeah. just like you, you you went through. And, and the other thing he did when he, when, when I was at the warehouse, I remember going to, cause I, I went to San Diego numerous times. And he was a lovely guy. He'd sell me stuff really cheap because like I said, he wanted to turn a quick profit. But I remember going, I was like, what's this? And he had this huge, he would like buy collections, just an, random animation houses that were like getting rid of stuff. And he had this huge, um, I guess like crate that was going to be just dumped. And he had someone going through them, like some 20 something year old. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, I've got all this animation up from this cartoon called Tales from the Tales of the Crypt Keeper or from the Crypt. <laughs> I was like, oh wow, there was a cartoon. I remember that. And he was like, yeah, we're just keeping the best stuff. And they were, they threw out, I just think how many tons. And I know, I, I can't name off the top of my head too many fans of that cartoon, but they're out there somewhere. And the fact well, that all this artwork just went in a dumpster, I'm like... EC I Comic, I mean, it it's so... So when I, I got a job at Warner Brothers in September of 1989, and I was 22 years old. And I, when I was there, I all I used to do in my spare time was wander around, because I worked in feature production, which is a pretty high level place so all i had to do is i said where i was from and i could go anywhere oh, wow. i mean I, literally i could open up any door i could go into any place and 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 they would just let me in and i would just hey because nobody cared when you're at the studio nobody cared to look at these things they didn't they didn't care and there's a there's a there was a thing called the scene dock and it was down it doesn't exist anymore but it's where they would put like the flats for a sitcom so a sitcom would have like the walls of a sitcom. There would just be, a, you know, the flats, yeah. they were walls. Flats are called walls and they would store them. And I, I just wandered through and would go through everything. And I found this is, so this is, this was 89. I found these two giant boxes. Now Warner brothers, it used to be Columbia pictures and Warner brothers were on the same lot. And then Columbia left. It was called the Burbank studios. Mm -hmm. Columbia went over to uh culver city when i was there and so there was these giant boxes and on the on the side it, it was painted c e 3 k and these are huge boxes i'm like c e 3 k that's close encounters of the third kind and so <laughs> these boxes are huge and one of them was kind of caved down the top and I, you know, I, I couldn't move it. Like there was nothing I could do, but I could kind of, they were kind of askew so I could look. So I pried open and there were these wood boxes. One of the boxes had a, a landscape model that was built by like Greg Jean of when the UFOs whoosh around this mountain corner. Wow. And it was, it was huge. <laughs> this landscape was huge. And the other one was the Devil's Tower landscape when the giant mothership comes down to Devil's Tower. And they were the miniatures. Wow. They were these huge, because they were so big. These miniatures were so huge yeah. that they were cased up. And they were, they've been sitting there since probably 1977. Right. Nobody cared. You know, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, And I, 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 I you know, I went and I was telling my boss, Bill Young, I'm like, you know, they could, you could build like a giant Lucite table and, you could just have these displayed in the lobby somewhere and yeah. it'd be awesome. And he looks at me and he goes, who's going to pay for that? Who cares? <laughs> and, and, and I'm just like, but, but these are like Greg Jean miniatures and, and it, but they were so big. They were so unruly. You couldn't, who's going to buy them? Like, even if you sold them at auction and that was, that was the thing. They also in the scene doc, they had like, if you remember the TV miniseries V about these aliens oh, yeah. on earth. Well, they had two full-scale V attack shuttles nice. that were just in the scene dock. Like, you you could go and sit in the cockpit. Like, I was <laughs> I'm just like, hey, you know, and they were they were just amidst the scene dock. And wow. I'm, like, I'm sure Rob's going, I can make a fucking movie with these. Uh, well, that's what I was, I was thinking. I'm like, you know, because nobody would care. Like, and I, had, I could come on the lot whenever I wanted. If I came on the lot and put those on a trailer and drove right. off, Nobody would care. <laughs> nobody, would, no, nobody would care. And, but the thing, my favorite thing, my favorite thing. So, they're 
so there's the Warner lot and down the street was the Warner ranch, like the, where the house, they had a, a normal, uh, like suburban street, um, where they, like the lethal weapon house was where, where, um, where Danny Glover's character, li- they, they shot a million things there, but in behind this, they had all these, these semi truck trailers in the back. And I had, t- I had keys to everything. I could go into anything and I had keys and there were like three semi trucks from the police academy movies <laughs> and so you would open up and there were like jet skis and motorcycles i mean all this stuff that was just and it, it, because they already bought it for the movie so it was already paid for and then yeah. you know in the studio they put it they put it away and nobody cares the so when people would come, this is the, 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 I don't know if I told this story before, but no, this one's new. So, well, so far, so this anyway. is a, this is a new one. So we had just finished shooting gremlins two. Oh, and we <laughs> shot, we finished shooting gremlins two and, and the, the big, uh, the shopping mall set was on stage 16, this giant two. It was amazing. So Rick Baker had done all the gremlins for gremlins two. Yep. And they were all in a lockup on the back lot. And there was about $3 million worth of gremlins. Right. So I I used to get called, um, I used to get called when like celebrities, if celebrities were shooting a movie, and their kids were with them, they would call me up and go because I because of my wanderings around the lot, they right. would go, can you give a tour? I would give the Rob Burnett tour of the Warner lot and show oh, people man. like here's nice. the V shuttle. So so we were shooting Bonfire of the Vanities, the movie, and it was on the lot, and it was Melanie Griffith, and I want to say like she's dakota johnson's mom now i don't know if it was dakota johnson because it might the timeline wouldn't work out i don't know how old she is but this was 1990 so i get a call that i'm supposed to take melanie griffiths it was like two kids one was a baby and the nanny and a little older kid and to take them on the rob burnett tour and i had just got the keys to the lockup of all the gremlins and I had never gone in there. I want. I'm like, hey, let's go check out. And I said to the nanny, I go, look, where we're, we're going to go now? I don't. You can't tell anybody. I can't. Don't tell Melanie Griffith. My boss will flip out. So you can't. And she's like, no, no problem. And so we open up the locker, this lockup, and it is full of the gremlins. And one of the things was in there was a gigantic gizmo head. That was like oh, wow. this big, and it was for the, the gizmo head shots, yeah. for the close-up shots, and you could move the eyes, <laughs> you know, the, the, because you could do the pulleys and the eye would, yeah. and so the the little baby was didn't, but the other kid was like, and I put the thing on his head, and so we're playing, <laughs> we're playing with the, and they had all the, and again, I could have just walked off with any of these things, but I never did, I never stole anything from the lot, um, because I had too much reverence for it all. And so we played with all these gremlins. And I said to the nanny, I go, just just don't don't tell anybody we're in this lockup. Because if they made gremlins three, they're going to need these. You know, who knows? Day goes by. End of the day, my boss, who's a nice guy, but he could be scary. Um, Bill Young calls me into his office. It's like 630. And he looks at me and um, he's like, so, you know, I got a call from Melanie Griffith this afternoon. And uh, she said her kids and her nanny had a wonderful time. And, you know, when we can, when we, the physical production department can make our talent happy, that's great. And he's like, if you ever go into that gremlins lockup, you will never work in this town again. <laughs> and, and he was, and he was, he was being tongue in cheek, but he knew because he knew that there was nothing that I wouldn't do. I would mm-hmm. go in. I would go in because I just wanted. And the the thing is, there was nobody at the studio that cared. My other yeah. two other guys I work with, nobody nobody cared. Like I, I nobody cared. And 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 uh, which was which was kind of too bad because as a movie fan, <laughs> getting this job, I I cared about everybody. <laughs> you know, it was it was I was there for a couple of years and it was it was a lot of fun. Man, a lot of fun. but that's no, a it cool was story. But then you learn, though, you learn, though, that because nobody cares, there's no thought of preserving anything. No. And and the people yeah, like yeah. you're talking about the animation cells, like if you 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 should have had somebody hire people that love this stuff, go through and catalog everything. Yeah. 
you know, and now scan it, just put it on scanners. That's what, like, literally, in my, I, I ended up over the, I, I started collecting in 1997, you know, um, on, like, news groups. Someone's selling a He-Man cell, I've got to get my hands on it. I ended up with, like, through the, my work with the official brand and everything, I ended up with a collection of animation cells about, I want to say close to, if not 20,000 cells, of, oh, sorry, cells and drawings, that is storyboards scripts etc and all i've ever done is scan it all in scan it all sell it to people that want it for like relatively cheap it's like oh if you want something to for your collection go for it but i've always been about archiving and scanning pr preserving because it's like this stuff will come in handy or has well i mean it has done over the years there's no doubt about it and it's it's funny to me people people really do think that you know in, to use He-Man as an example, oh, Mattel have a huge vault, and in that vault is all the pre-production, all the prototypes of the figures, all the artwork and all that. No, it's not, because all of the artwork and a lot of that material was uncovered by fans speaking to the artists that worked on that stuff, and it was, you know, most of the time this stuff would just get thrown. I mean, isn't, isn't it like on record that so much comic art was trashed over the years oh yeah you know, and that, that stuff breaks my heart i mean i don't know what happened to a lot of a lot of jack kirby's pages i know i know the, the i jack mean a kirby's... lot of collectors yeah they were but but here, the thing about it is especially disney has a great archive and when we were working on the the blu-rays and stuff like going to tron being when i was doing tron going to get those codaliths and everything they had the 65 millimeter blow up frames and all that so disney preserved a lot of that stuff that's good stuff. but but there's um the, the funny thing is, is like when you get hired to make something in Hollywood, you get hired to make the finished thing. So yeah. when it's finished and you turn over, they're not particularly interested in no. preserving the animation cells that you no. th once you deliver the thing, they're like, whatever. At they most, just, they want the negative. And even then, that's yeah, the they don't like like I mean, I when I was doing when you do dvd like our our the the interviews we do for these things um like for instance when we were working on the lord of the rings special editions now new line wanted those tapes back but we did hundreds of hours of interviews for the extended versions of lord of the rings hundreds of hours wow. uh, and on the, each discs of the extended lord of the rings represents 10 hours total of material so, like, my boss interviewed Peter Jackson for each movie for, like, 15 hours. So you have 45 hours of Peter Jackson talking about the making of Lord of the Rings. Most of that material will never, ever be seen. Those tapes, I mean, they should have been digitized. I, I maintained, I said, you know what New Line should do is set up a website, an archival website, where they have at least the interviews in audio form. But and great. and uh, I mean, especially now to listen, to, people would listen to them, you know, and like I interviewed the Greensman who took care of Fangorn Forest for like four hours. Or and even course, just make it a digital download at this point, like if you buy. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It, know... just, it just has to be audio. But then the, the thought is, well, then there would have to be a legal department that goes through because if somebody said something that, uh oh, might be offensive or, uh oh, you know, we have to scrub that out. Um, they That's why they don't do it. And a lot of it is the reason they don't want this kind of stuff out is because they can control the final product. And if, if you don't, if there, if, if nothing else gets out, nobody cares. And after, as each year ticks by, there's less and less people that even care. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I say there is a bright side to this also at the same time. Um, Cause you have a lot of the boutique companies, you have guys like you, James, who are making sure some of this stuff does get, you know, preserved. You know, Robert, you for a while were working in that, you know, side of things. And there are people here and there in the industry who are speaking up, but it's going to take a lot more than just that. Uh, I mean, of course, it costs money to preserve a lot of things, space to preserve a lot of these things. So, I mean, those things need to be, con you know, taken into consideration. But, I mean, I'd be all for donating or being even part of, like, a an organization that gets together to just basically preserve what we can find and, and for all these things. Cause it's uh yeah, it's stuff that we're never going to be able to find again uh, down the road. And it's worth more now than it ever was before. At least people have understood that, but yeah. like the whole thing with like the Warner brothers thing recently, it's just like, I mean, we live in a world where people know this stuff is worth money. Even yeah. the, the most, you know, novice. Well, you'd be, you'd would, be surprised. Like, yeah. It's just, to me, it's still at the same time. I'm just like, 
what the hell? Cause we're ever, I mean, I love going through like the, whenever they have the, 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 the auctions and stuff and seeing what they got up for props and all that kind of stuff. And hell, they've sold a lot of those gremlins that you had in the <laughs> warehouse. Yeah. Well, that, and that's the thing. I mean, like those, that. a lot of those were made of foam latex with armatures right. in the middle of them or, and, and that foam latex deteriorates, you know, it, it literally disintegrates. So unless you're going to pack it like in a vacuum free or a vacuum, environment right. luckily we've got the academy museum now <clears throat> you know here in la the motion picture academy museum and and they were out and, and look there's a lot of people there's i have a lot of friends very wealthy friends that have purchased a lot of really great pieces um of film history and the thing is though when and a lot of this stuff like it's like when star trek they had that big christie's star trek auction where they took everything in the warehouses, all the miniature models of the ships, all the yeah. uniforms, and they just sold it to fans, you know, and it's cool that they did that, but I would have made a Star Trek museum, you right. know, and put all that stuff in one place. I mean, you had like Jeff Bezos bought the eight foot model of the enterprise refit that was built for Star Trek, the motion picture. It's just sitting in the uh, lobby of his rocket company, blue origin. And it's one of the greatest, models i actually got to interact with it when i was working on the star trek experience it's one of the greatest models ever made for a um a movie and all those models that ilm built whether it was the excelsior or whether it was the reliant from star trek 2 all that stuff the grissom from star trek 3 the klingon bird of prey how cool would it be to have a star trek museum someplace and all of that yeah. stuff is collected but but they they didn't want to store it anymore, so they just yeah. had an auction. They made they made millions of dollars and they sold it all off. Well, that's a way you can actually pay for the storage of it, right, and preservation of it. Well, that, yeah, they, they, very, that's it's a museum, yeah, exactly. You know, and and who wouldn't? To, Star Trek had so much stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I I went to a um back back when we were showing the Toy Masters documentary in Montreal, they had a traveling Lucasfilm show called star wars identities and it was a museum show with all these models and all these props and what was really cool about it was you were given a card like you were given a character and you'd go through the museum it was kind of like the wiesenthal holocaust museum i mean i say kind of only in the sense that you're in the wiesenthal museum you'd be given the card of a kid or somebody that was carted off to a concentration camp and as you went through the museum you could put the card in and track their journey yeah, yeah. well star wars identity had this thing where you would at each display would be like this is the battle of you know what is it before bby or something and during this battle you would choose what you would do so you would either choose the dark side or the light side and you could make these decisions as you went through this museum but they had all these great miniatures star destroy all the model model stuff and so you, you had the Lucasfilm Museum, but then at the end, when you come out of the museum, your your character would be flashed on this big screen and it would tell you if you were a Sith Lord or a Jedi based on the but the 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 museum thing was amazing. And I know that George Lucas is building a museum here in LA. Yeah. I don't know what the oh, status okay. is, but that Star Wars identities thing, and this was this was in 2012, it was awesome. And seeing because they ILM kept all that stuff. You know, they didn't. George mess. did too. Yeah. He made yeah. Sure. Um, the, one of the few things that got away was just stuff from the earlier first film. I remember like they found one of the Death Star models in front of some like store somewhere. Yeah. Oh, it was being used as a fucking trash can. Yep. I should not. No, uh, it's some it's guy's true. like, that's not. That's the Death Star. And he's like, <laughs> And he started. I think he asked the owner like a few questions. He got to figure. I was like, "Where did you get it?" He's like, "Did you make it? what? You like where?" He's like, "Oh, I got it from someplace. I don't even know what it was or whatever." But it was missing like the the dish uh, piece. Right. So what he, the guy had done is set it up, and he put trash bags in there. So it was basically a trash can now. Yeah, so I can't remember who it was, but some fan ended up buying it and then ended up uh, getting it back into. I think he ended up getting a hold of one of the dishes from one of the guys who worked on it and stuff like that and was able to put it back all together but it was like it was one of the big full models though like it's just like yeah. crazy where it's all painted on the 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 details and all that kind of stuff but of course yeah. it was faded and chipped away and stuff from being set out in the sun for 
30 years or whatever it was, 40 years by the time it was discovered. Yeah. But Jaws, same thing happened with Jaws. Like, because they had thought like some of the, the models they had outside of Universal were like ones from like the ride and stuff. And it turned out they weren't. They were ones from like the original molds and some other stuff from like part two and stuff. But anyway, oh, wow. um, Tweaky Kid sent in a member chat. Let's get through these here. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about your loose Shimer images and then we'll let you get <laughs> out of here because I'm sure it's like two in the morning for you by now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He goes looking maximum. Uh, he, he, he's uh, maximum effort puppy. Uh, he was looking maximum, feeling minimum as I finished the long working day. Uh, glad that this stream is on to make it go faster. Well, hopefully you're done by now because you sent this in at the beginning of the show. Uh, Aurora Uplinks became a member. Thank you for that, and also sent in a two dollars chat super chat and says loved what saw of Ghostbusters as a kid. Happy times, yeah. Uh, and then nerdiness intensifies, <laughs> says Canon Falador. As I pointed out to you, this is we have not lost like a single viewer the whole show. So like, yeah, these guys are in there. You guys got them just enthralled, just like we were in the background here. Melodic Method says Ghostbusters cartoon nostalgia. Take me away. Q heart. Yep. <laughs> Warrior of Justice says what you call an orphan taking selfie family photo. Oh, of course, he's always got to have the jokes. Uh, warrior justice uh then preston bruno sent me a paypal and says when i was really young uh really little sorry my mom <laughs> got rid of my real ghostbusters toys and never let her live it down when i was in high school the real ghostbusters time life box came out oh okay and the oh. whoops I, I hit it twice and the deal was if i bought it if she bought it for me <laughs> i would leave her alone i still have the box set to this day overall the box art is aesthetically pleasing and well designed i keep it on display separate Perfect from my problem. dvds and blu-rays you know i wanted this so bad and i never got my hands on it i ordered it and it sat there on back order on amazon forever oh, no. and then they just canceled my order one day yeah, I don't I'm think like, it was like a big distribution thing, was it? That's no, it wasn't. It was hard to get your hands on. Um, and Indira says it all belongs in a museum. Yes, it does. So, like, yeah, now if you want to get that time life set, you're going to spend a couple hundred bucks at least. Yeah. So how much did you have to say in, like, the design and all that kind of stuff of the box? Or is that something the design that was, was I those mean, guys? Because uh, Emiliano Santalucia, who'd worked on the um, BCI box, says he'd done pretty much all the illustrations where he'd, you know, he, we didn't didn't have any well, we had cells but he was you know creating new artwork for the dvd so he, he was able to mimic all these animation styles from he-man to dungeon dragons to defenders of the earth etc and so andy was like let's get emiliano on to do the real ghostbusters artwork so i would say to emiliano here's a bunch of model sheets you know do what you can and yeah he put together those uh, those sets and yeah they, 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 i thought they came out really good i mean it's a no-brainer that the box is the firehouse. I was that was a really it's, it's an obvious gimmick, but it, it worked really well. Um, and yeah, that the 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 sets the sets themselves were like little what they call them steel books. But the DVD. Yeah, it was right. one of the earlier steel books I remember. Really too, nice. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I I I you know I've got the box that obviously I've still got it, but um, I tend to keep the steel books out to one side just so they're easier to go through without having to take the set right. off and get through so each thing. Keep taking it apart and it damages the box because it keeps... Yeah, I mean, I did drop the box moving once. I mean, the box is pretty much a write-off, but uh, oh, the rest, no. yeah, the discs are fine. And yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll email Time Life and say, I worked on this set back in 2008. Any chance I get another one? <laughs> pretty get me really one, man. What? Like I said, you know how many hundreds of dollars it is to get? No. <laughs> Do you know, let me ask you something, James. Did What about the paintings from the sides of the boxes of the original He-Man toys, like the Battle Cat art. Oh, all the Rudy Abrero stuff. Yeah, William yeah. George. Oh, that's man. The, yeah, that's... I mean, uh, Earl Norum did a bunch of stuff. A lot of that stuff ended up in the hands of collectors, and luckily it's been scanned and preserved and presented in books. So in, in a way, that stuff did. It wasn't in Mattel's vault, because it, would just, it either went back to the artists or, like I say, just ended up in the hands of fans. But luckily... I'd say 90 something percent of uh, fans of He-Man and She-Ra are always willing to share their collections with like, because Dark Horse put out a lot of really good art books. I worked on most of them, I think. And yeah, a lot of fans contribute their stuff, their collections to it. So we've been very fortunate in that sense. Um, Real Ghostbusters, yeah. Good, yeah, good I'm pretty sure in the, uh, in the book you guys have not only an image of each of the figures, but you have like the image from the box, one in the package, the back of the box so you guys did a pretty yeah, good there, job there was a book that um pixel dan did um i came out yeah. a few years ago and yeah he he and val staples like 
really did their yeah utmost to kind of preserve a lot of that stuff but yeah a lot of the original artwork that 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 again it's stuff that you just really don't get there's a lot of like new artwork on the current he-man uh, packaging and branding but that original stuff maybe because it was 1982 1983 it was a lot still that fantasy element that frazetta that was still you know inspiring those artists whereas these artists now are just inspired by the he-man stuff right. so I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit too cynical. No, there, no, yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on with that. That's yeah, just there's uh, a difference to it. Like it's it has a it's it's a uh, it's been it, was, a it was it was oil on canvas as well, a lot of that He-Man stuff, you know, that, that original artwork. Norum, Rudy Abrero, we were just all... when you guys did those beautiful scans and you can tell they're off of the canvas oh. and shit. It's like wow. There's, there's, I've got some scans, I've got I think I've got a scan of that original Castle Grey Skull artwork and it, it's so uh, whoever did i can't remember who did the scan it might have been emiliano santalucci who did the artwork for the ghostbusters so when you zoom in you can see the little you know the canvas mm -hmm. uh in little limitations yep. it's just like oh this is gorgeous stuff yeah but yeah that um that ghostbusters set yeah just the, the 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 end result i thought was really good like like you say the quality of the episodes is what it is yeah um, and yeah there's like there's a few little errors and stuff but for the most part it was you know that i'm not saying you should be thankful for what you got, but there was nothing, you know, I think even in the UK, we had yeah. like just two volumes and then this came no, out. No, there oh. hasn't been a chance that you've heard any movement on anything since the new films have been in the process. Like maybe they're going back to remaster them. Cause like Sony's really good with remastering things they, actually. Yeah. I mean, so. I haven't heard anything. Cause I mean, like, to be honest, not to, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, not to complain, but I'm not sure many companies, you know, certain companies definitely won't hire me. And I'm, just, I'm sure I've pissed off like Universal and Sony over the years. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, but we know how not, that goes. Let's not hire that guy. But I don't know. I don't, I, that said, like I have worked with Universal over the years. So, you know, you never know. You never say never. But um, yeah, the, 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 that set got, I think it might have even won some, no, it was at the He Man set that won the awards. It was one of the sets I worked on, won a bunch of awards or like you know, D DVD related awards. Like, That's pretty cool. I would think it would have been the Ghostbuster one, but you, yeah, you would know better than me. But yeah, so let's Ghostbusters. speaking of He Man, uh, you got to visit Lou Scheimer's house, yeah. So Andy Mangles, I mentioned before, was writing a book on Andy or, or like an autobiography, and uh, so he was interviewing Lou quite a bit. And I'd met Lou numerous times. Um, I went to Lou Scheimer Productions when he had the office, um. Oh my God, where was that Lushan Productions? It was, I feel like it was up the road from Canoga Park because I once walked that way. I might be wrong, but anyway, all, all, in, the, all in the valley. But yeah, I've been yeah. to Lushan Productions. I've met him a few times and um, I'd, I'd been, uh, I knew him at, like when I was working on the He Man box sets, I was flown over to San Diego Comic Con. So I got to sit with Lou and chat to him numerous times, like at the booth and stuff. But Andy was doing this book and Andy said, Do you want to go to Lou's house? And I was like, what he's like yeah yeah i'm gonna go to lose house i was like oh my god so we'd go you know private driveway and it's it was it was i mean it's the most amazing house i've ever been to because it was literally at the top of this hill that overlooked all the other mansions Whoops. and i was just like that's crazy how is it you know and, and you know lou was always such a bloody humble dude he was just like so <laughs> you, he never you never felt like you were meeting lou shire it's just like oh there's this guy that you know is funny and humble and lovely and warm and yeah he invited me you know me and andy went up there and he showed us around or showed me around andy been there a few times and i was just like this house is incredible that that camera if i remember rightly was one the the camera it was in his living room and i think he said that was used in the making of like some of the fleischer cartoons and i was like wow, oh, wow. yeah it was like a proper piece of history i figured it was, it was like the first camera they had for filmation or something like that no no wow no Holy no because i i, I I think I may be wrong. I'm sure um, Lou worked at Fleischer for a while. Oh, wow. One of his okay. first jobs in the industry. Um, yeah, and he basically had this um, in, his, in his living room. And it was it was like, you know, you think, oh, this is the this is the house that Filmation built. You know, He Man, She, all these like huge, you know, money making cartoons and stuff. And yet, there was only like his one little office. Everywhere else was like a house. But I think as a fan, you always think, oh, it's going to be like wall to wall <laughs> paintings. You know, images of all these cartoons it's like, oh no actually it's a house <laughs> and then you've i'm got... not as surprised as you'd think because i know just from listening to a lot of his interviews how much of a family man he was so i'm sure oh. he tried to make his home life 
oh, it's, very it's, simple for his kids as far as like you know not bringing work home and making it like this movie star pad and all that kind of stuff. Do you know the funny thing about this house though, right? So beautiful place, as you can see. Right. Like, yeah, as you can see, like yeah. infinity pools that went down. I think it was like three levels. It was just like yeah, it looks like it. Oh, wow, and the view of the, the valley. It was, but this is the funny thing, right? And you may yeah. know where I'm going immediately as I start talking about this. <laughs> Early, was it late last year? I watched this, I thought it was a fantastic series called The Offer, which was the making of Oh, Marvel. man, did loved I love that it. show. Loved it was it. incredible. Like, I'm not one for jumping into too many series these days, but I thought, oh, I like, you know, Godfather's a classic. But I looked at the cast. I, I like Miles Teller and, um, oh, what's her name? The, the young lady in it. Um, I just got a really me no Juno Juno, Juno Temple. Temple Juno Temple yep and, and Matthew um, Good is Bob Evans Matthew I know Good right so <laughs> Ozzy so Bandeas is what the and he becomes Bob Evans it's like but if anybody is, knows it's like why yeah. he didn't get an Emmy nomination I don't I know did, right it's like that that show so I really I kind of started watching it and I was like oh I'm, I'm hooked right away I was kind of watching it and then I was watching it watching it I was just like right, I'm in and there was there was a few scenes. Where they showed, um, oh my brain's gone. Director and writer, oh my god, um, <laughs> Coppola, Coppola, and uh, yeah. Mario Puzo, Mario Puzo, Mario Puzo sitting Sorry. outside <laughs> of the pool writing, yeah. But it, and I kept thinking, oh, that's Lou Scheimer's house. Well, I know, that. and it wasn't, but there's a scene later in one of the uh, episodes where it's at, um, uh, the, the, the head of um, Paramount at the time, not the head, um kind of the guy who's running the studio is it uh bob, bob, evans. bob evans that's yeah, matthew good and yeah. you see yeah matthew and you see um a, a poll and i was like that's lou shimer's house i was like i know and i went online and there was like an article and it said filmation uh for you know sadly passed away but filmation um head for uh, lou shimer's house was used in the offer and i was like oh my god that's <laughs> yeah, right. i mean this is a great example of mid-century architecture too i was gonna I mean, say yeah is... looks got that right look for the era yeah. yeah it was it's it's it was beautiful i mean i was gonna say it's one of the most beautiful houses i've been in it's like of course it is it's what i think it's sold for like five or something million maybe more millions yeah um, that even seems years back. low yeah because <laughs> after he passed away um yeah like erica obviously erica shimer's daughter didn't want to live there um jay shimer lou's wife had passed away um i think you know, i feel like 20 2009 or 10 something like that um, and yeah, this was Lou's office, and, and Lou was like, "Take a seat," and I was like, "Okay." And Andy was like, "Let me get a photo." Um, so I was just like sat in Lou's uh, uh, chair. I was like, "Oh, I, I feel the power." <laughs> but it was, um, <laughs> and I always, I always talk about that trip because then we went and had lunch in like Lou's favorite restaurant, which was I, th I think uh, it, it was it was more like a diner than a restaurant, which is we don't really have diners over here. We have restaurants, but not diners over here in the UK, and. You walked in there, and they all everyone in there knew Lou because he'd been going there for I guess decades. And you know, after we, we actually went to the Jay Shimer's wife was in hospital at the time, like just I think just for a checkup. And we actually went into the hospital, and I was like, I'll stand outside. Lou was like, No, come in and see Jay. And Jay, his wife was there in bed. And she was like, Hey, how you doing? And I was like, Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I've met her a couple of times. She wouldn't know who I am, but I was like, Hi. And um, and like then we went back. I think that was the day we had like a day break from working on the Ghostbusters set and then the following day worked on Ghostbusters and I fly back to England and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going through the photos and I was like oh my goodness I didn't get a photo I, I've got photos with me and Lou before but I was like I didn't get a photo of me and Lou and it, it not it didn't bother me but I just kept thinking why is that and I just I always tell people the story it's like it's because when you were around him he made you feel like you were the important one and it's like but you're you're the guy that kind of shaped a generation of kids or generations with your entertainment, right. but he was just Lou. That's the thing. And it's just, you know, I remember sitting in the diner and him going like, so what are you working on the moment? We talked about the Ghostbusters and stuff. And it's like, well, Lou Scheimer, I should be asking you hundreds of questions, but he never made you feel like he was, you know, Lou Scheimer. <laughs> if he walked around like, you know, cock of the walk or something, you'd be like, oh yeah, of course, he's Lou Scheimer. But he wasn't that guy. Yeah. He was just always so humble and my friend like i said who lives in los angeles lee mm -hmm. would bump into lou all the time because they live pretty much kind of in very similar very same area mm -hmm. and um he said lou was always like just would stop for a chat sometimes lee would be like i've got i've got to go lou and lou's like okay catch you next time kind of thing and bump into him in like a bar or something but um yeah just lou, lou was such a great guy and it's just he like, seems oh, like I, you would have been yeah and, 
I think he passed away 20, I think it was like 2012 or 2013. I was going to say 2012, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, um, it was just like, oh, man. I got to ask, yeah. though, because, you know, uh, did you work on the Star Trek animated Blu-rays at no, all? No, I didn't. Robert? No, no, not at all. Well, like, Robert, like, did no, you? No, we, we, I did not. And, okay, because um, that's the one crossover we got here with Filmation is yeah, they did no, do the that, Star Lu, Trek series. Lu, Scott, yeah, Lou Scheimer did that. We, we did not. We, we were going to, you know, there was talk that was really interesting. There was talk. There was even a test done. Uh, CBS Digital did a test. What, what there was talk about taking, and they could still do this. Paramount could still do this. Obviously, the animation for the Star Trek animated series is not the best. I mean, they had to do limited. it on the cheap. Very limited animation. I they, love it though. They, I, I, the, well, <laughs> it's the stories the style, yeah, yeah. The stories though are pretty great, and they did get most of the voice cast back. So there was right, thought. Yeah. There was thought about redoing redoing each episode. And and reanimating the episodes oh, wow. with modern CG techniques, oh, and there was Lord, a test done, but like <laughs> nobody wanted to pull the trigger on. Well, look, they would Paramount would release the originals, oh, and true, then true. I was hoping what I wanted to do. Of course, I wasn't in a position of power to make this kind of decision. I sort of like animatrix style or Star Wars vision mm. style was you would give the audio to different animation studios throughout the world Let's and see what, see what they would come back with. And you know you'd have, they'd you'd still have to know that the characters were the characters, but yeah, but but and the designs were vaguely the designs, but you know there's been manga Star, Star Trek comics, and done in manga style, and I always thought it would be really cool to give. Um, I worked on, um, I met my ex-wife actually, for a number of years in the '90s. I worked on a series called Masters of Russian Animation. And what we did was there was a company called Films by Jove that bought the rights to all of these famous Russian animated short films from decades over the course of decades. And my job would be I would get the I would get the films and I would do whatever color correct, whatever video version we got. I would do some color correction. I would add subtitles um, and then I would add their opening and closing graphics and then. Um, my wife had done the, my wife to be had done the motion graphics and, um, she was, she was from, she's Ukrainian and, um, uh, we would, we would do this and, and I worked with her on and off for three years and that's, they're all different kinds of animation styles. There was stop motion animation. There was cell animation. There's a really funny animation, uh, a film called, it's called film, 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 but it's got a song. And it's it's all about how a movie gets made in Russia, and what's really funny about it is it's not very different than Hollywood, and uh, you can see it on YouTube, you know. But um, I, I was thought just because working on that collection, every collection you can get them on, they're on DVD. It's called uh, Masters of Russian Animation. But if you're an animation fan, I would suggest picking them up because there's some incredible work, and it spans decades of Soviet. Uh, uh -huh. art and it's it's i don't even know if you can get those dvds anymore but they were great to work on and um i always thought man if you could take the star trek animated series and do do what we did with with uh, masters of russian animation where there were so many diverse because i remember coming to la one of the first things i did when i moved to la in 1988 i want to say in 88 there was a an animator named Vladislaw Steryevich. And I don't, was he Polish or Russian? He started doing stop motion like in the 1915, 1916. Oh. And, and, you know, you know, editorial, a lot of filmmaking was born in Russia. Like uh, Sergei Eisenstein wrote, really wrote the first book on edit film editing. Um, um, sculpting in time and it's all about the five levels of montage and so when i was studying film and specifically editing a lot of what i was learning and a lot of early animation the a lot of these pioneers were were russians and you know that's it that's why it's sort of it's it, it's always frustrated me that my entire life that the russians have been our enemies because yeah, i understand they're proud people they want to restore their empire but so much of so many great things have come out of russia and animation is one of them and that's why it was so much fun to work on but i always wanted to see them if if you could do with the animated star trek series you take those audio 
uh, with you just take the audio and then give it to all these animation studios and see, see what, what they the would come up with. Are, yeah. You know, kind of like in the Animatrix as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and stuff like that, where I thought that was pretty audacious that the Wachowskis were allowed uh, had the Animatrix done because there's a lot of different. I mean, the styles are so wildly different, right. but it, I wish people would do more of this. I mean, we get a lot of it. There's a lot of Japanese animation anthologies and Chinese animation anthologies, but I wish we saw more yeah. of this here in the West. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> no, but like I was curious because like, yeah, that's the one crossover there. But uh, is there any other interesting stories about Lou that you have to share with us before we wrap this up, James? Or I know we're going to have to come back and revisit this, obviously, when you got some time. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's probably numerous Lou stories. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, I, it was just I mean, the, the the summary of Lou Scheimer is just like an incredibly lovely fellow, and it's um, yeah, I just I just it's one of those things you look back, and it's like oh, I wish I was in Los Angeles so many times and I never went just to see him, and it's like oh, I wish I'd be you respect people's privacy and stuff. It's like oh, I wish I'd seen him more. Um, yeah, just one of those things. But yeah, it was every every kind of moment I shared with him, it's like I really valued it because it's like wow, I got to. You know, when I talk to, you know, fellow He-Man Shearer, just Filmation fans, I'm like, oh, my God, you met Lou Scheimer. I was like, I went to his house. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it's bizarre. But it's, um, yeah, it's just I'm so kind of count myself fortunate. But it's also, you know, it's the hard work he put in that gets you to those moments sometimes. It's just like I didn't just rock up to Lou's house. I had worked hard in the 90s doing He-Man Shearer websites that led me to official work, that led me to DVD work, that led me to Andy Mangle saying, do you want to do a Ghostbusters box set that, let us up the hill to lose beautiful house. You know, it's uh, wow. it's always a journey. I feel like I'm getting quite deep there, but I'm not. <laughs> no, but it's really amazing because uh, I love hearing your stories, just like with Robert's stories. And I know our audience loves hearing it, just like the guys who were here before. Uh, they love hearing this stuff. And this is uh, what the show is all about, kind of getting into the nerdy nitty gritty of how it's all done and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, like, again, we're going to have to definitely have you back again soon when you got the time and, I want to thank Robert again for showing up as well. And uh, mm -hmm. Robert, is there anything coming up that you want to plug by chance that you got going on? Uh, well, just, you know, we're, we're doing our Star Trek Picard season three after shows every Thursday. Tonight is an episode called Vox that will leave everybody breathless and your jaw will be hanging uh, on the floor when you see the end of the episode, <laughs> especially if you're a Star Trek The Next Generation fan. Yeah. Um a lot of stuff goes down and if you can't watch it right away tonight stay off social media until you can because there's a lot of of surprises and joy to be had and then of course you know my own show uh Rob observations and um uh just just doing all of my um all of my shows so join me on the Burnett network yeah. on youtube of course the Burnett network the link is in the description as is james uh link to your youtube channel you want to plug anything you got coming up i know you mentioned a, a video you were working on earlier but uh do you got anything yeah, to drop it to or... into the, the ghostbuster stuff i've got this i just did it finish that 20 minute video all about uh devolution of janine melman it's melman's character from C season one syndicated <laughs> it's all good until like, we go the through the version say again the less slutty version the less yeah. slutty version yes but yeah season two until the point where the last season of real ghostbusters is like is that even janine so I did a video about that. I've got videos coming up about the Marvel star imprint of the Masters of the Universe comic, which, again, starts off really good. No, it starts off really bad, I should say. And then they get this writer in called George Carragon, who, or Carragone, who transforms the comic into something good for five issues before it's cancelled. But, um, yeah, I, I'm doing all my 80s cartoon videos and lookbacks and retrospectives. And, yeah, come over to my Serial Geek TV YouTube channel and... Uh, and uh have a good time what am i even saying <laughs> oh check it out uh and check out the, the burnett work and uh valiant renegade and fanzine i'll be over on fanzine here in about a few minutes actually i think this this show will actually redirect you over to there where we're going to be talking about our our physical media picks for the week uh so there you go but i'm sure you're going to be getting some rest james since it's like three in the morning almost for you there 221. <laughs> 221. Yeah, see? Yeah. But thank you so much, James, for your time. We appreciate it. And like I said, we're going to have to have you back again real soon. And uh, Robert, hopefully have you back again next week. I kind of like having you here every week. It's nice to have you. Oh, a, well, thank, thank uh, you. I a mean, true 4K master, even though I tap Come on, man. Flash dance. Here, but... Who, who's in love with this 80s cover? This <laughs> that is, is an amazing one of the this best the most steel books. 80s steel book. Oh, I love it. Ever. I, I love it so much. So far, it's one of my favorite steel book designs of the year. Uh, yeah, um, for sure. 
it, you can't beat that. It looks amazing. Um, even though the movie's cheesy, hey, it's it's flash dance. It's it's a necessity. You yeah, but the it. way it, the way it's done, it's you know, in '83 you got The Hunger and you have Flash Dance. And they were such MTV movies in terms of the way they looked. It was the, it represented the British invasion, Adrian Lyon and Tony Scott making his first film. And you had Alan Parker before that and Ridley Scott mm-hmm. and all these great British commercial directors with their high contrast lighting and single single source lighting, making everything look cool. I mean, they were the best, man. <laughs> no, I think it looks great. And uh, I can't wait to watch the whole film. I, sh- I sh- put it in just to watch like the first 10 15 minutes the music through. the opening yeah. mute over the it's fantastic it's amazing yeah even, like I said, even for the music alone yeah right yeah i need to, I need to watch flash dance again yeah <laughs> you guys well, are selling it to me i know right <laughs> it's a, I, I can't believe like valiant's like ah oh, it's a chick flick i'm like yeah but it's a chick it's a sexy chick flick i mean what are you talking about <laughs> like, it's great a lot of young men were awakened by that film in 1983 <laughs> <laughs> so anyway Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, hopefully we see you over on uh, the uh, fanzine side of things here. Take care, everybody. Let me find my button here to get us out of here. Here we go.